Hello and welcome back to Soteriology 101. Today we are going to be talking about such an uplifting and positive uh, topic, <laughs> infant damnation. <laughs> dum dum dum. Uh, it's, it's not, it's, we have to laugh to keep from crying. Um, but um, that other guy down there at the bottom of the screen uh, just stirred up a hornet's nest by posting some things. And so Jordan, I take, Jordan's that, I that take other guy. I blame. <laughs> I okay. willingly take the blame. Yes. L let me catch up everybody. What's happening. Um, back in the day, Warren was, I guess we were all in this program. I guess it was from a clip from our program where we were talking about, you know, different extreme versions of Calvinism and views of Calvinism. And sometimes when we talk about the logical implications of a particular view, what I'm reminded of is when uh, Roger Olson was having a debate with the Calvinist and he had the question answer time and he, and, and uh, somebody cornered him and said, you know, I can't believe you would say that you know, Michael Horton and these good Calvinists believe that God's monstrous. And, and, um, and, and Roger said, no, wait a second now, that's not what I'm saying. I, I, I love my brother, Michael, uh, a Calvinist, Michael Horton, a Calvinist. I, I love my brothers. I know many Calvinist friends who I'm very friendly with. He said, that's, I'm not trying to accuse them of saying God's monstrous. I, I, and, and what Roger explained in a very kind, fatherly kind of way, he did a really good job of explaining. He said, what I'm trying to say is, I could not believe what the Calvinist is saying about God because I would have to conclude he's monstrous. And, and that's one of the reasons I reject those claims because they paint the God that I love and I believe in in a monstrous light to me. And I, I, that's why I reject it so vehemently, um, which is very similar to things that John Wesley said about how what Calvinists say seem to paint God in a worse light than the devil himself, even though we very well know John Wesley was highly esteemed by many other Calvinists, including Spurgeon uh, and you know, Charles Wesley and others. Uh, and they were friends and were able to get along and do things together, even though he made a statement that harsh against Calvinism. Uh, other statements like C.S. Lewis uh, talking about how Calvinism and belief in total depravity can be another form of devil worship in the sense that we worship an all-powerful all demon or om omnipotent fiend, he, he puts it. Um, he, he's making an argument based upon logical implications. If you believe this about God, what are the logical implications of that? And so I, I admit when I heard Warren's comments parallel, paralleling uh, pagan sacrifice of children to infant damnation and the concepts related to Calvinists, um, I knew where he was coming from because I know a little bit more about Warren's background. And I knew that he was making that same kind of inference of here's where it can lead to. Um, but in the clip, when it's just put out there the way it was, Calvinists interpret that as to immediately mean, oh, he thinks Calvinists all believe that we don't even care about our, you know, kids. And if they're reprobates or reprobates, oh, well, you know, laissez-faire. Um, and obviously Warren doesn't believe that. But I'm going to let Warren speak for himself because he usually speaks a lot better than I do about these things. So, Warren, uh, if that were the case, before, we would have had that clip, would we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so my background is I, I've I've been pretty much every flavor of the Calvinist rainbow, right? But I was raised in a very high form. Uh, some Calvinists would call it hyper, but an extreme form of Calvinism. I've talked about my grandfather's church having hundreds of people when I was a kid, but because they didn't believe in outreach, because whatever is going to happen has been decreed and whoever's elect will come and whoever isn't, why? Yeah, think think Westboro Baptist type, you know, yeah, I mean, not, a little bit like not, that. You're not very far off there. And so as a result, that church would die out because they weren't bringing any new people in and the kids would move off or leave the faith. And, and I remember pastors getting up there and, and quoting you know, maybe not well known like John MacArthur or R.C. Sproul types, but they were quoting like, you know, the heroes of the Calvinist flavor that we were a member of, you know, talking about how, oh, yeah, it's most just exceedingly just, you know, Jonathan Edwards, that God should take the soul of a newborn and cast it into eternal flame. And but they were they would build on this. And we had, we'd have those conversations over family dinner. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable when you're a kid and your parents are talking about, oh, yeah, it's you know, if God's determined you to go to hell. Like there's nothing I can do about it, you know? And, and so when, when we're having this conversation originally, the context I think is very helpful. Um, I wasn't saying all Calvinists believe this. I was saying the spirit behind those who are willing 
to placate their own conscience and say, well, as long as I'm elect, you know, it grieves me that my child is, is suffering eternally, but, you know, it's worth the price of admission, essentially. And I'm drawing on that upbringing that we had. But I also know that that's not unique to this particular form of Calvinism. Early on, Arminians also, there was a strain of Arminians that would hold to a form of infant damnation. Within Roman Catholicism, there's a strain of Augustinian anthropology that it holds to infant damnation. That's where the whole concept of infant limbo and um, the... Yeah, uh, the roles were, that, that, even that article that we were talking about, that role that even demonstrates how the roles were kind of reversed back in the day, mm -hmm. where the Calvinists were arguing against some of the Arminians because Arminians believed uh, still in original sin and original guilt and the same kind of concepts because they're from the Augustinian grid, but they believe you had to have faith, uh, a faith decision in order to be saved. And therefore, uh, you know, people who died in their infancy never had faith. So they would have to be uh, condemned based upon that logic. And even the Calvinists were, were stepping in to argue, no, God can have mercy on whomever he wants to have mercy, including infants if he wants to. Uh, and so even some of the Calvinists were, were fighting against, ironically, Arminians back in the day uh, for the fact that infants actually are saved, which is the roles kind of have reversed. It seems like. Well, and uh, I think anybody who's familiar with my work on YouTube have seen my series on original sin where I quote, I have a clip of John MacArthur in his own words talking about how any child who dies goes to be with the Lord. And he's quoting the scripture saying that they're not guilty, that they're innocent. I, I say he's being inconsistent with total depravity, but I know that he doesn't affirm infant damnation. Well, you're not the only one who says he's inconsistent. Um, actually, J James White also is asked that question. Uh, and uh, he, he actually mentions Justin Peters, I think it is, that holds to MacArthur's view. Mm -hmm. And he says he differs with them on that view. Uh, and and then he goes on to give his view. And that here, is, you you have the the standard Baptist evangelical uh, perspective, which is basically based upon the concept of an age of accountability, um, mm -hmm. and uh, that that this basically says similar to what Zwingli said. Um, Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, in Zurich said that all infants who die in infancy and all idiots, that is obviously the terminology of that day, anyone mentally challenged, um, anything along those lines, um, that all infants die in infancy and all those mentally challenged um, go to, when they die, go to heaven. He says, I can't prove it. You can't disprove it. Um, that's just, just my view. And that's as, as far as you can take it. There are a couple of passages that I think the, the tendency is to build way too much upon them, um, mm. especially uh, David and talking about the infant who died, uh, a few things like that, that were very unusual instances of divine judgment for human sin in a very, very particular context. And extrapolating that out to all infants in all situations, I think, is, is a bit too much. But... Uh, if you're familiar with the London Baptist Confession, it utilizes the terminology of elect infants. And so uh, what I start with is I, I start with the presumption uh, that God is just as free in this area uh, as he is in the salvation of adult human beings or older human beings. That is, uh, that it's a matter of God's grace. Okay, so there's one, and then here's another where he's quoting from Augustine uh, in, in, in affirmation of what Augustine says, as you'll hear, and I even put it up on the screen so that you can read with, uh, with him what he's arguing for. Here it is. Okay, one infant enters into the kingdom of God by grace because God is good. Another infant deservedly does not enter because God is just. There is no question of fate in either case because God does what he wishes. But although we know that one is condemned according to the judgment and another is delivered according to the mercy of him whose mercy and judgment we praise with confidence, who are we to ask God why he condemns the one instead of the other? Shall the object molded say to him who molded it? Why? Okay. And so then he goes on to quote from Romans nine out of context. Um, but notice, I, I want you to really catch what he's quoting from Augustine saying. One infant enters the kingdom, in other words, is saved by God's grace. The other is deservedly condemned 
uh, by God's justice. That that is White's position. Um, he he. There are, uh, in other words, non-elect infants. Um, in other words, there are people um, who there are infants who died or were aborted, who are not elected, who will be forever in uh, in eternal hell. Um, that that to me is appalling, uh, to be honest. Um, I, I think there should be a lot more outrage about that. Than, than anything Warren said in context of what he talked about. Um, but nevertheless, let me let me finish the clip because you'll hear him actually affirm this and then restate it as if as if Romans 9 is talking about reprobation versus the hardening of Israel. But ne nevertheless, he, he goes on to quote Romans 9 as if it's supporting this infant damnation concept of reprobation. Why hast thou made me thus? Is not the potter master of his clay to make from the same mass of vitiated and condemned origin one vessel for honorable use according to mercy and another for dishonorable use according to judgment? He does not make both for honorable use lest the nature think itself to have merited honor as if guiltless. He does not make both for dishonorable use that mercy may triumph over judgment. Therefore, the condemned has no right to complain about his punishment, nor can the one gratuitously delivered glory proudly over his merit. Instead, he humbly gives thanks when he recognizes in the one required to pay the debt what under the same circumstances was bestowed upon himself. Now that, again, is pretty much what our discussion has been over and over and over again. Um, and not only is it you know, straight out of Romans chapter 9, Okay, so notice he, he says it's straight out of Romans chapter 9. So he's affirming what he just read from Augustine, that God condemns infants, um, and, and they, they have no right to, to complain about that, about being condemned for that. Um, now, what was interesting, when I pulled, I was looking for these quotes, and I just Googled, you know, James White and infant damnation. Um, and the first one that actually came up was from a 1987 blog article. And, and this is from James White. I looked it up and it, it is from James White, but he shifted on this perspective. He took more of the Zwingli, uh, MacArthur, Justin Peters view back in 87. So he's become more consistent in his Calvinism. And I, in other words, higher in his Calvinism over the years, because the question he's answering here in 1987 was about the same thing about the mentally incompetent about infants. And he says, the Bible does mention an age of accountability, as we call it, where the youth know the difference between good and evil and are responsible for that decision. Little is said other than this. Therefore, we have little to go on in discussing the condition of the infant or the mentally incompetent. Since they, have, they make no conscious decisions against God, it is inconceivable that they undergo any kind of punishment. Now, I think it's really interesting that James White earlier in his ministry recognize what we're saying. Now, he must have been a raging or a plagian back then, um, but now he's all better. Um, but nevertheless, I think he's seeing exactly what Warren was commenting on about being so grotesque with regard to the claims of infant damnation. Because to us, just like to James White in 1987, it is inconceivable that God, our God, would punish an infant who dies. That is inconceivable to us. That should, in my estimation, that should create the kind of outrage 10 times, 10,000 times, the Calvinist outrage against Warren's comments. Um, and and it, it's really baffling to me that there isn't more outrage for that kind of a view. Um, and so he, he says that, and then he also goes on to talk about Zwingli, just like he did before, and he says, rather, it's rather clear that they are ushered into the presence of the Lord. Eurig Zwingli felt that all who died in infancy or who are mentally incompetent um, were of the elect of God. And I feel comfortable. He says, I feel comfortable with that idea. Now, of course, anyone who asks you this question is neither an infant or mentally incompetent. So he goes on to say, in his radio day, debate with McKinsey, he pushed the idea that since Jesus said no man comes to the Father but by him, and babies can't accept Jesus, then there must be a, they must be in hell. I tried to point out to Mr. McKenzie that people are punished for sin. Babies have committed no sin. Therefore, how can they be punished? Good point, Dr. White. Maybe doc, the mm -hmm. Dr. White of 1987 and I would have gotten along a little better. Um, at that point, Mr. McKenzie said, I don't know where you got the idea that you had to be a sinner to get to go to hell. Um, you go to hell not because of your acts. You go to hell because of whether or not you accept Jesus. 
I tried to get him to see that Jesus' statement in John 14, 6 is in reference to all men because all have sinned, not in reference to those who died in infancy and never committed a sin. Interestingly enough, this is what McKenzie would have called extra biblical topic, and he claims to avoid such topics. The Bible nowhere says baby go, babies go to hell. McKenzie is making up his own ideas as he goes along on this <clears throat> one, since he has created a position that is not biblical. Am I not just... Am I not am I not just as safe to say the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for all infants and mental, mentally incompetent? If I could say I could say that if I wished, if someone simply would not allow for babies to be innocent, have a sin nature while not having been guilty of individual sin. I I thought that was really telling that he was willing to say infants are innocent back in 1987. And, and I guess, again, he was a raging Pelagian, and he got better. I Maybe mean, he got healed from his Pelagianism. I don't know. But back in 1987, Dr. White has a more balanced view, uh, more uh, like what we would see from MacArthur or maybe John Piper, who believe all infants are saved and doesn't believe, therefore, an in infant damnation. Um, and I just want to want to point that out. Now, real quick, and I, I know I'm talking a lot here, but I'm trying to set the stage for the conversation we're going to have with Dr. White and Dr. White's rebuke of Warren and a little bit more of that and give them more time. But I want you to hear other reformed perspectives being laid out here. And here's a, here's another one, uh, from a, from a guy you may recognize cause I debated him, but he, he's a very staunch reformed, uh, Calvinist. Um, and you'll hear his perspective on this the as well. Position. The alternative is People are born with a sin nature um, that, that all people all have fallen short of the glory of God and they don't fall once they reach a certain age at four or five, but all from birth have fallen in Adam and have a sin nature, um, are not innocent. Um, they bear moral guilt before God. Um, and therefore, the only way to enter the kingdom of God, John chapter three, you must be born again. Um, and God sovereignly causes people to be born again by grace, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and gives to them the gifts of faith and repentance. So the Reformed position, whether you're 1689 Baptist or Westminster Presbyterian, is that uh, regenerate infants who die in infancy go to heaven. Okay, so regenerate infants, elect infants, as, as, uh, that, and that's White's current position. Yeah that uh, yes, elect infants would go to heaven, which this is also on stage at a large Baptist conference. You'll hear it right here. Canons of watch. Dort, first head of doctrine, article 17, say that godly parents may believe without doubt that their children dying in infancy are elect and saved. And I think that's true. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. And he goes on to talk about David's uh, baby who died. And so th their position is that e even further, not only elect uh, infants, but children of elect people are therefore elect as well. And so how you explain, um, how Christian parents, godly Christian parents have children who end up not accepting Christ. I don't know how they explain that except to maybe say, maybe the parents weren't really elect after all. Um, uh, or there's anomalies, <laughs> I guess the, of, of non-elect, uh, children occasionally like, you know, and I don't want to name names. I, I don't get into to, to naming names, but but then there's also um, John Piper is another good example of more of the MacArthur view, um, where he he really takes a position that all infants uh, actually are are saved. And it's interesting to hear his reason for that. And he says it, and it, it's kind of um, quiet. So uh, um, I don't know. I won't play all of this, but I just want you to see. I think they're all saved. The reason I think that is be, and, and that, in other words, I don't buy the principle of covenant life that says children born into covenant families are secure and children born into not covenant families aren't. And, and, and probably a good reason for that, uh, that many of you know, if anybody knows kind of a Piper situation. But um, but he goes on to argue that Romans one twenty pretty much guarantees or says I'm kind of hearing a buzzing in my ear. Anybody else hearing that? I don't know if it's somebody, somebody's. It's not Warren. Oh, it's that other guy. That other guy. Yeah, 
Yeah, you, oh, you had man. a you got a background buzz or something going on, uh, like a a fan on in the back. I'm not sure if there's a fan or something running, but anyway, I was just going to say real, just as a quick um a quick summary of what Piper argues is that if if pe people he seems to suggest he says that Romans 120 does see there is a legitimate excuse if you've never experienced general revelation to the point where you understand and see the 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 that which would condemn you on Calvinism. In other words, general revelation is enough to condemn you. Well, an infant or mentally ill or mentally handicapped, they would never have that amount of general revelation. So they would always remain innocent. And my point is, or my, my response to that is, okay, then why wouldn't the reprobate on Calvinism be in the same boat? Because they can't hear and understand in a significant enough way any more than a child can. In other words, they are no more able to understand and to respond than is a child. So why would you say the mentally ill and the children are exempt, but not the those who are reprobates from birth that can't help it? They're they're both just as um they're both they're both equally uh blinded from spiritual things because of a natural condition whether it's their age being only two years old or being a, an infant in the womb or whether it's some other external thing, it, it's still it, equally incapable. So why wouldn't they be just as innocent? And, and so Piper's view seems very inconsistent with, with uh, basic Calvinism and reason you have this whole debate and the difficulty of it. So I've talked enough, but I wanted to set the stage for kind of what people view here and I know Warren, you've written articles on this before, and and again, having a background in a really more of a hyper or high Calvinist uh, upbringing, I know your perspective may may be a little a little uh, a little different because of that. Yeah, and and again, like I mean, my comments were about people that have this spirit, so that transcends the whole Calvinist versus Arminian versus provisionist versus Roman Catholic versus. I'm addressing the spirit behind that that says God will cast infants into hell. And, you know, that they appeal to that, their their own election to kind of placate their conscience around that. My criticism was particularly, um, and maybe I could have been more clear in, in enunciating this, but my criticism was particularly about infant damnation. Now, there are implications that we could then draw out, like we've kind of hinted at during the, the opening here about like adult children and things like this. But particularly my criticism was was regarding the, the doctrine of infant damnation. And so if you're willing to throw a, a baby on the pyre to get good crops or to get a good income or to be blessed, you know, it's the same kind of spirit. In my, in my criticism, you know, people were like, are you going to apologize? And I'm like, no, I'm going to clarify. But I don't, I don't I think if I owe an apology, it's not for being harsh enough. I, I think the doctrine of infant damnation is antichrist. I, I, I can't detest that doctrine enough. But here's where I'll clarify. I don't think every Calvinist affirms this. And I've I've known that when I made the statement because I've done videos on this topic like you talked about. I have a whole series on original sin. I've done uh, guest speaking and teaching engagements and things like this where I will literally go and quote Calvinists who reject infant damnation uh, to show that it's not a monolithic view within Calvinism. They don't have to affirm infant damnation. Now, I don't think it's consistent with their system. So I have a, a larger criticism against the system. But but no, my, my criticism is against this particular doctrine, and I think the spirit behind it. And uh, and and there are there are parents that have been duped into believing this that are grieving and tormented, and they, they go, I hope my child is one of the elect because I was elect or maybe God, re, you know, regenerates babies before they perish. And they, they've got all this internal turmoil, turmoil and angst and heartache and, and grieving. I mean, people have had miscarriages and, and young children that have passed away in infancy and, and in childhood, and it, it breaks their heart and they're wrestling with it. And I think that this puts a wedge between them and the loving heavenly father that welcome their children into paradise and is, is showing them the love that he is prepared to show their parents. And, uh, and so I, I see it as, as a perversion of who God really is. And so I, I really object to it in and, and part because of my background in part because I'm a parent, but also because I've been a good steward of scripture 
for the last couple of years. And I've come to see that God is far better than I was taught. And I get this kind of revulsion, but it's against the, the ism. It's against the ideology. It's not against a victim of it. You know, if somebody comes in and goes, well, I believe in infant damnation and I think my children are, are suffering. I see them as a victim. I don't see them as someone to come after and malign. But at the same time, I wasn't claiming that every Calvinist holds this view. That That's silly. But that's what happened when the clip yeah. was removed out of context and then commented on in an isolated fashion. People didn't go and look at the full context. They didn't reach out and ask any sort of clarifying questions. They just go, oh, you're saying this about all Calvinists, you know, and now we're going to clutch our pearls and in indignation and rage. And, you know, so it was, it, well, was, it kind of set the internet well, on fire for a little bit. Let me just acknowledge that taking that clip and posting it was fully my decision. I didn't, I didn't consult Warren or Layton. I found that clip after we had that conversation that that moment stuck out to me. And a couple of weeks later, I was thinking about it. And I was like, you know, I'm going to make a clip out of that. And hindsight, I don't, you know, I, I told them before the show, um, I hear, I hear the complaints. I hear the the complaints that that kind of blew up on Twitter about it. And I've kind of been back and forth on the one hand. I'm like, yeah, I think you guys have a good point. On the other hand, I, I, I see the point Warren's making. Um, I think probably, um, you know, making sure to, to know whether the clip that I'm posting has enough context to communicate clearly. But I think the thing Warren that's, you know, that stood out to me was that both you were emphasizing like you just did the spirit behind it and the mindset. I think a lot of people unnecessarily concluded, which I think anybody who's listened to you at all should know you're not arguing that all Calvinists think that if they, you know, that, that, that God has to not elect their children in order for their election to be granted. And therefore they're okay with the uh, exchange. Mm -hmm. That was obviously not your point. Um, and th the other thing that kind of stood out to me that I'm, I'm still kind of made me feel okay, uh, uh, validated, I guess. And, and maybe I'll change my mind in a few weeks. I don't know, but with posting it was, you know, and, and you're going to hear this in James White's, uh, uh, clip here here in a minute where he's going to start shooting off accusations and labels of man-centered and and those sort of things or free will worshiping you know all these labels that are put on non-calvinists and my point in bringing that up isn't to say hey you shouldn't you shouldn't label non-calvinists man-centered i think somebody can say hey i think your theology is man-centered and do it in a genuine respectful way and that's just the the honest assessment of our position and your, your evaluation is to say, hey, I think that's man-centered. I wouldn't have any problem with that. I, I would have a problem with somebody doing that in a hateful, you know, derogatory way, as is often done. But I don't, you know, I guess I don't see, I, I, I have trouble seeing other than maybe the cultural sensitivities in terms of the language of idol and pa pagan um, I think there, you know, there's some sensitivities around that sort of language that would make it seem on the surface m more of an offensive statement. But at the end, Calvinists, what are they doing? They're labeling non-Calvinists all the time as man worshipers. If you're calling us man-centered, you're saying that our theology, our soteriology is centered around man and not centered around God, which is idolatry. You're saying we are worshiping man in that label. Almost every interaction I have with a Calvinist, that label is going to come up. And so, so I, I, I get the point that perhaps more context would have been nice. And I'm glad that Warren's able to clarify that here. But on the surface, I don't, I don't see how, I don't know. I guess the, the, like you said, it seems like there was a lot of feigning of indignation uh, of just, oh, this is so appalling. How could you possibly say such a horrendous thing? And, and, uh, my thought was kind of like, isn't this, this is just kind of what we're doing, isn't it? This is, this is the thing. We think your theology is terrible. You think ours is, is terrible. Uh, that's, is that not where well, we're I, at? I think and the so clip why is it you, shocking? I think, I think what you posted uh, sparked a conversation that needs to be had. And that is about this doctrine of infant damnation. You know, you have, you have Rome who came out with the um, International Theological Commission and their paper, I think it was in 2014 or 2004, and they walked away from infant limbo. They wrote about how there is a hope for the salvation of infants who die without being baptized. Um, 
you see, I mean, the his, the historicity of this in the Anabaptist uh, quotes and statements from the, the early Anabaptist movements and the Eastern Orthodoxy. You see in Judaism, they, they don't have these issues of infant damnation. It's, it's a unique construct of Augustinian anthropology. And so, you know, not every Augustinian affirms it. It's, it's kind of like the, the, the Augustinian mechanism is there and how they construct those pieces together can result in infant damnation or not. And, uh, you know, you have Roman Catholics that will kind of hold more to that view and you'll have some that don't. You'll have Arminians that do, Arminians that don't. You'll have Calvinists that do, Calvinists that don't. My criticism is of the doctrine. And what's interesting is a lot of people saw that and they got offended. They, they said, this is personal. You're coming after me. And I go, well, the only reason you would take this personal is if you affirm this doctrine. Otherwise, why are you upset? Like now, and if you do, if you do affirm this doctrine, then we need to have a discussion over it. I'm not coming at you as a horrible person, but I think you've been duped by this, this mindset or that this, this spirit. God is better than that. He doesn't require, um, you know, infants go to hell for some sense of honor or purpose or divine justice because he created them in the womb through tradition well, or, you know, other means. It's just, it doesn't make sense. I think, I think we also need to acknowledge that even, even John Calvin admitted that the, this doctrine was, you know, uh, a horrible decree. I mean, dreadful, I think dreadful. is the word. In yeah. fact, a reformed theologian, um, H.J. Van Dyke, he wrote this. He said, now let us be candid. And, he's, and this is guy is a Calvinist. So, okay. So keep that in mind. He's a Calvinist. Now let us be candid with ourselves and even with our opponents. In other words, let's just be honest about this guys. You know, it's just candid. All right. Historic Calvinism does include what Calvin himself self called the hor horrible decreum or the dreadful decree um, that by the election and predestination of God and many nations with their infant children are irretrievably doomed to eternal death. It's where you get the, the phrase doom from the womb. Uh, and that, that, that is a quote from Calvin as well about being doomed from the womb. Um, I find those doctrines offensive. Um, I, I find them to be a uh, blight against God. I'm thankful for as inconsistent as you may think there are. I think that I'm thankful for Piper and MacArthur and Zwingli and others who have argued historically that infants are not being punished by our God for an eternity, especially those that, that hold to eternal conscious torment. Um, and, and I, and I think that there should be much, much more outrage against that view than what there is. Um, I think the 1987 version of James White is a lot more consistent with the, the view of God that I hold to and that I believe in than the present day James White. I think James White is always accusing us of becoming more and more whatever he thinks we're going to become. And it's quite obvious that we've discovered in this uh, preparation for this broadcast that he's becoming whatever, you know, the higher and higher form of, of uh, hyper kind of Calvinism that he's becoming. And so I guess like he, he can anticipate that I'm going to become a liberal and fall off the edge of the earth into uh, whatever uh, form of open theism or whatever form of liberal theology that he thinks that I, I'm, I'm heading down the road towards. And, and I can predict that he's going to become a, you know, frozen, chosen, hyper-Calvinist that, you know, never evangelizes. I, I mean, again, that's all ad hominem. It means nothing to the, to the points of the debate. Um, but, and, and lest, lest you think this is just something or a topic that's only talked about, you know, here because we're just trying to get it Calvinist or we're just trying to be mean or something like that. Um, even even uh, John Piper brought this up at one point and, um he said this, this is back when his children were just young. Uh, he said, um, I, I'm not ignorant that God may have not have chosen my sons for his sons. And though I think I would give my life for, for their salvation, if they should be lost to me, I should not rail against the Almighty. He is God. I am but a man. The potter has absolute right over the clay. And so here is where he seems to kind of say, you know, maybe God is reprobating my child, but I'm still going to worship him. Um, now he, why he would say, I think I would give up my life for their salvation. I don't know. I think any 
any decent person would just say, yes, of course I would give up my life for my child's salvation. Um, and, and maybe that's what, what he's meaning. I didn't, I didn't hear the, you know, I, I read it. You said it's hard to tell the passion of the person behind it. And I know Piper's a passionate person. I can imagine him tearing up talking about his, his boys. I'm sure he has a genuine love for his boys and really wants their salvation. But this is where he and I would diverge with each other. I, I don't, I don't know how I would worship a God who reprobated my child for his own glory. I, that would be, it would be like, you need to worship this omnipotent fiend, this all powerful demon. This is, this is who he is. You need to worship him now. It, it would require determinism for me to worship that God. I, I could not choose to worship that God. I, I do not believe that is the God of the scripture. I, I believe that is a, a false view of who our God and he, like Roger Olson said, that is a monstrous absolutely preposterous, monstrous view of God in my estimation. And I think it is causing damage to the church. I think people are turning away from the God of scripture because of that false view of who God is. And because of that, I'm thankful that people are having these kinds of conversations, even though, yes, that that uh, clip was flammatory. Um, I kind of tend away for, from it, inflammatory types of things. I try to, at least sometimes I, I jump right in the middle of it too. Um, but because I'm not, I'm not wanting just to offend for the sake of offending. Um, but I don't mind offense if it actually helps teach a lesson and brings to po a point something that needs to be discussed. And, and the outrage from one little clip about a parallel between some high, very high forms of Calvinism and the spirit, not that actual Calvinists believe it, but the spirit of that parallel of, of willingly to, I'm going to worship this Moloch and sacrifice my children for this Moloch, you know, and if it means I have to sacrifice my child to the reprobation of God and I'm going to still worship him. And there, there was a parallel parallel being drawn to that, which again, I know is inflammatory. I get that. But at the same time, if you're so outraged by that, why would not, why wouldn't you be outraged by the actual doctrine being taught? of God punishing a, an aborted baby because they weren't elect. That just, mm -hmm. it just, it really does baffle me that that doesn't cause more people to really, really begin to question their doctrines and their theology. And I know some of them are like, you know, on this, oh, well, that's not, that's not what I believe. Well, then Warren wasn't talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> why, why are you objecting? Yeah. If, if you agree with Warren that all babies are saved, then why are you an outraged? <laughs> so we're not talking, we're not talking about you. And so he was talking about a, a particular high form of Calvinism, which does teach infant damnation. And, and if you're not one of those, if you're like Piper and MacArthur or Justin Peters, then he's not talking about you. God bless you. Uh, gl I'm glad you're not. Um, if, if he's talking about the 1987 version of, 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 of uh, James White, then hey, you're fine. This just it, shows if, that the 80s yeah. were better than any other decade since. Right? <laughs> give, me, give me 80s movies and music and culture and 80s James White any day over what we have today. I, I think it was cooler. I think it was it was hipper. It was a funner time to be alive. You know, so give me 1987, barely, I, I, 1987 James I, White. I, I like that. I'm a, I was born in 89, so I just barely, barely made it in. I feel like I can't really claim to be an 80s born baby, but I still do. So it was a fun yeah. time to be alive, man. But one, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to note, when, when you and I and the other guy, when, we're, when the three of us are, when Jordan and I and, and Leighton, when we're talking about our children, we're doing it in the context of infancy and, and young childhood. But someone listening who has maybe like a 30-year-old child may not understand that and then go, well, wait a minute, my 30-year-old child, and they start to think of it this way, and they go, but my 30-year-old, you know, I've, I've, I've raised in fear and admonition of the Lord, and I've taught them, and I've done these things because I care. We're not talking about competent, mature, responsible agents making bad choices, rejecting God or accepting God. That's a completely different topic. We're talking specifically about infant damnation and very young uh, children or the mentally challenged that God has determined when they die to send to eternal torment. Um, but then here's the other thing too that, that that I wanted to note. And we may we may get to this if you're going to play the uh, the James White part. He says yeah. 
that God has determined the ends and the means, which is interesting because if you believe that God has chosen to reprobate your child, let's say that we, we have a child who goes wayward, right? That means that every time we told them about the Lord, every time we took them to church, every time we read them the Bible study, every time we prayed with them, God was using that as the very means to send them into their reprobation. He used us to reprobate our children when we thought we were loving him and doing the right thing. And I think that that also perverts the nature and character of God. I don't think that that's consistent. So I think that this doctrine really kind of opens up and says, what are we looking at here? Is this is this really biblical? And my, my objection is based on the scriptures and, and admittedly, the, what I, I believe is the thumbprint of God on my conscience, my, my God-given faculties and, and all of that. So I'm not free of a bias. I have five children. Um, I have to confess that. But I think when studying the scriptures, when looking at these things, I come away going, there is no way that I can look at the scriptures and say that God is eternally reprobating and damning infants to a life of eternal torment. Now, we could get into, well, do babies die? Yeah, that's the first death, right? There's there's arguments to be made like that. We could look at, well, did, did God tell Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Yeah, but did he have him do it? No, because he's not Molech. He's not, he's not Baal. No, you know, no. he, he didn't do it. He was showing I'm different than the others. I, I'll do for you what those guys think that their gods are requiring. I'll do for you. I'm the servant God. I'm here to wash my people's feet, not send their babies to eternal torment. So, you know, this does tend to open up a little bit. But again, I want to stress my criticism is of the doctrine of infant damnation or the damnation of young children who have not yet reached the age of being able to rightly understand good and evil. Isaiah talks about this. Uh, in, I think it's in Deuteronomy where he says, your children who do not yet know this day uh, the difference between good and evil. If you're going to condemn those people to hell because you think God has decreed them, then you're doing something even far worse. Christ said, see that you do not despise these little ones, and you're despising them so much that you're sending them to eternal torment when God himself would not do it. So I have significant biblical grounds for rejecting this. But my heart breaks for those who've been deceived by holding this because I think it hurts their relationship with God and their children. I think it makes for a, a very difficult life uh, here and in the next world. And, and yeah. I think that this can actually send our children far away from God. I know what it was like playing with my Hot Wheels and hearing that God may have elected me to reprobation and my parents being like, break my heart, but I'll be there. I'll sing his praises. And I, I know what that's like. It, it hurts your relationship with your kids. It's not. It's not drawing them to the Lord. It's not honoring him. Okay. So Brenton is a resident Calvinist and he says this, he says, every time you guys say, there's no way God could reprobate my kids. Remember we're talking about infant. I, my, my children are all adult children. So that's a, a different situation are all over 16 any, anyway. And so, but we're talking about infants and, and mentally in, in handy, handicapped is what we're talking about, Brenton. So and when we say there's no way God could, uh, Reprobate is a different word, by the way. Reprobation really has to do with people being condemned before they do anything bad based upon a false, or we would say a faulty interpretation of Romans 9 of before Esau did anything good or bad, um, he was reprobated. He was chosen for damnation. Um, and of course, we don't believe that's what he's talking about at all. And we have many, many broadcasts talking about that. And so when uh, when we, there's no way God could reprobate my kid um, we're saying that, you, yes, you're right. We do not believe God reprobates unborn babies for, before they did anything bad. We, we think that that's a gross misrepresentation of God and a gross, gross misinterpretation of Romans 9. Um, and we say that out loud all the time, and I will shout it from the rooftops until the day I die, because that is a really bad interpretation. Even some Calvinists don't interpret it that way, by the way. Um, they, they, they make it even more symbolic and, 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 uh, you know, don't don't take that high view of God literally hating and reprobating uh, Esau before he did anything bad before he was ever born, and that represents everybody who ends up dying and going to hell is that God ultimately reprobated them before they were born. And then you say, well, you say there's no way God could give them what they deserve. What does an unborn baby deserve in your world? I, I, I that just doesn't it doesn't compute with me, Britain. Why in the world would you think an unborn baby deserves an eternity? suffering in hell. What, what, what theology were you taught and did you learn and where did you learn it 
that babies before they're born deserve an eternity of punishment. Even James White, 1987, recognized that is preposterous. And I think deep down inside, it bothers you to the core of your being because I believe you're a spirit-filled man, Brenton. And I think the spirit of God is screaming out to you, no, God does not condemn the innocent. And I can't think of anyone more innocent than an unborn baby. Sue me, even for goodness gracious, guys, you're Zwingli. Of all people, one of the harshest high Calvinists did not believe in inherited guilt and the condemnation of infants. This form of high Calvinism is so high and so extreme. I cannot believe the Twitter outrage against it is not is not thousand times worse than what we saw in response to to Warren's uh, comments. It's just still baffling to me. Um, and that's sorry, I get that's on my, my soapbox. <laughs> well, Leighton, I just I I want to reemphasize what you said earlier. How you're thankful that people like John Piper and John MacArthur or I think being inconsistent in, in saying, kind of telling a different story here. And, and I think maybe that, you know, that gets to the heart of what I think was going on inside of me when I made the decision to post this is, you know, I, I was just reading through uh, uh, some of the doctrine of infant damnation earlier today, uh, preparing for this. And I just found myself kind of struck with thinking about thinking about mothers real i mean this these are real life scenarios here where you have mothers sitting in a pew hearing this that that god is such that he very uh may very well have chosen to create your unborn baby or maybe the the two young small children two and three years old sitting next to you in the pew um you know, if there's one one thing that keeps me, another thing I focus on a lot on my channel is a specific cult group that believes in a mother God and all these other wacky things. And I tell people all the time, the reason I go after this group isn't because I, you know, necessarily I disagree with the doctrine of mother God and they have wacky views. Obviously, that's part of it. But the reason I go after it is because what that theology ends up doing to people and how it harms people. I, I am I have no doubt whatsoever that this concept is hurting real people. People who are rational enough, I think, to actually internalize it in a consistent way. They're going to say they're going to be in turmoil. I, I mean, you you can't not be in turmoil uh, and and have this deep, I think, cognitive dissonance to to continue on and and uh you know, any sort of like worship, worshipful relationship with God. But this is something that damages people. Theology, bad theology, it, it hurts people. It just does. And telling, telling mothers, telling fathers that God is such that he might have created your child doomed from the womb, uh, brought your child into the world before they had done anything deserving of an eternal torment in the pit of hell. Um, you know, that... I, you can you can you can say that as a a doctrinal proposition, but when you really anybody who sits down and internalizes that, if you have kids, if you if you truly believe that is that's the reality, I don't I don't know how anybody who's really considering that in its full implications is going to end up anywhere else but like a mental institute, because that that if that is true and you believe that's true, if you know you really know that is the reality, I, I just. Unless you're some sort of sociopath, I don't. And I, I, again, I'm not. I'm not saying this to be intentionally. You're trying to you outdo know, my last inflammatory. Yeah, okay. I, I guess I am. You're going to end but, up on James uh, White's radar no, again. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah, I think me, that it, the cognitive dissonance has to come in because I don't think people are truly internalizing it, and there is they're sort of disconnecting from that. I think if you really connect with that doctrine and believe it. It, it, it's going to, it's going to mess you up. Um, I don't yeah. know how it could do anything else. Thank you, Vernon, for your super chat. And BJ also, uh, BJ Allen um, says, what, a, what about the exact accusation accusing Calvinist parents that they are like the parents that sacrifice their kids to Bell? Calvinists here on YouTube chat have said that's the accusation. Uh, I'll let Warren take that. Like, um, our, one, I, I'll just say, I, I did not take him as saying, 
Calvinist parents are exactly like the parents that sacrificed their kids to Bell. That's that's not the way I took his quote. <laughs> no. uh, otherwise, I probably would have hung up on him uh, in the context. But I did not take his quote that way. But I, I'll let Warren respond to that. No, it, it's funny because people have you know, things on the internet often serve as a mirror, and people will project onto that content what they um, are dealing with internally, or what maybe there's some sort of misunderstanding. Um, I did not say Calvinist parents are like Baal worshipers offering their children to Baal or, or, or Molech. I said the spirit that is okay saying, all right, my children have been eternally reprobated and my infant is in eternal torment right now, but it's the same, I'm it's the elected. same spirit same that Wesley, spirit. It's, that Wesley and Lewis were saying they're willing to, to worship a God that's worse than the devil. Wesley's quote. They're willing to worship an omnipotent fiend, uh, Lewis's quote. They're not literally saying that Calvinists worship an omnipotent fiend, an all-powerful demon. They're not literally saying God is worse than the devil, according to Calvinists. Um, they're making an accusation based upon the parallel argument. Uh, if you believe this about God, then it seems you're making God out worse than the devil, and you're still willing to believe and worship him. You might as well worship an all-powerful demon if you believe that about God. That's the argument. Okay, go ahead, Warren. I had to yeah, jump and, that and in. So, no, so I'm critiquing the spirit behind that view. I'm not saying all Calvinists hold that view. And in fact, over on Twitter, uh, thanks to uh, Jordan posting that clip over there, it caused a small firestorm. And what's interesting is in the comments here, in the comments on Twitter, you'll have some Calvinists come in and they're defending infant damnation. Then you have other Calvinists come in and they go, none of us believe that. What are you talking about? Yeah, That's a straw man. You're you're projecting that. You're lying about us. We don't believe that. And uh, and then you'll have some Arminians come in there on their white horse to rescue the Calvinists from the Pelagian uh, uh, provisionists. And they're like, <laughs> oh, you know, shame on those provisionist guys for, for misrepresenting Calvinism. I'm like, dude historically Arminians were accused of infant damnation and they held to it to, to degree like within small camps. And so I'm criticizing that spirit. I don't care if it's in Calvinism. I don't care if it's in Arminianism. I don't care if it's in Roman Catholicism. And if you want to know my anthropology, I have tons of teaching content. I'm going to, I just did, I, I think I mentioned it. I just did a teaching series. It was translated into Portuguese I'm going to run through that again probably tomorrow on a live stream just in English only so people can understand why I reject this imputed uh, uh, guilt uh, that Augustine uh, formulated. But no, I, I'm just I'm criticizing that spirit that goes, you know, God, you can have my baby. I'll still worship you because you've saved me. And that, that, that's, that's horrendous. Paul was willing to lay down his life. I think most Calvinists, I'm going to shock everybody. I think most lay-level Calvinists would be willing to sacrifice themselves for their children. I don't think they have that spirit. Most Calvinists, I don't think, have that. Of course, I don't think most Calvinists know what Calvinism is. Otherwise, they would be consistent, and then they would fall under my criticism. But I think most Calvinists love their kids. They teach them about Christ. They go through the motions out of genuine care and concern, being obedient to God and His instruction, and out of a deep desire that their children be uh brought into a relationship with God. I don't think that's necessarily consistent with their doctrine, but I'm not going to claim otherwise. I'm not going to say that they don't have the heart for their kids. I, I, I get offended when people come at me and go, you're claiming Calvinists don't love their kids. Like you're, 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 there's only two. Let me be careful. There's a couple options. When you say that about what I said, you were sincerely not paying attention and misunderstood the context of my statements. Uh, you're not even familiar with the entailments of this doctrine and that it, that it exists. Or three, you're being, let's just say, less than charitable and you're misrepresenting me and being intentionally polemical, weaponizing my statements out of context so you can drive the algorithm. And, uh, you know, to call me a liar over this, I've been called a liar. I mean, I have, what do you, you want, 20, 30, 40, 50 quotes on this? Historic? Do you want quotes from confessions and creeds and famous Calvinist teachers. And, uh, you know, do you want, you want Fulgentius of, uh, of Roos? Do you want Augustine? Do you want John Calvin? Do you want Jonathan Edwards? Who, who do you want? I, I'm not making this up. It, the criticism is based in an actual doctrine. And if you don't affirm it, don't call me a liar. Go, man, Warren, I, I don't agree with that. I think you're making some valid criticisms. You know, I'll go, okay, cool. You're my brother in arms. Let's fight this bad doctrine together. My, fellow Calvinist brother over there, you know, I'm, 
But um, it, it's funny how this thing had, had snowballed, but that's what happens on the internet and it makes for an interesting conversation. And now we're able to come in and tell people God is better than the God that sends babies to hell. And that I'm willing to, I'm willing to die on that hill. Okay. Yeah. If, if I stand before the <laughs> Lord and he goes, Warren, how dare you believe that I didn't send infants to hell? You're going to hell. You know, well, I'll be in there with a lot of babies and a lot of other Christian martyrs that these people have, have been revering. And, you know, I'll, I'll be brokenhearted to realize God is not as good and holy as I thought he was. I just don't think he's going to condemn me for thinking that children are the standard for admittance into the kingdom of heaven. And you have to become like them, you know, and not to despise them. I, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, that's all right. I, I know you had a soapbox in you on this one. Um, let, let's go to the the clip from uh, from James White. Um, uh, where he critiques us on this. I'm tr- I have to find it, when I restarted just a minute ago, I lost my place where he, he gets to critiquing us. And so I may have to fast forward a little bit to find it live, but that's just live broadcasting for you. So, um, here, here is, uh, Dr. White rebuking Warren and, and he, he rebukes me pretty harsh for not hanging up on you. I, I think <laughs> I yeah. more, more upset with you, I guess is what he wanted me to do, but nevertheless. And, right. uh, Future, future members of the Dominican order. (laughs) One point I remember I did, I didn't do the singing, but I, we took somebody else doing the singing and the the music would just stop to, uh, to, um, um, open theism and all the rest of that stuff. And and I got, all right, sorry about that. I had it queued. Uh, well, you'll see. Here it is. So yeah. this pops up, and it's uh, Leighton Flowers. Nothing new there. Uh, Warren McGrew. Uh, haven't talked about him in quite some time. We we were engaging with him fairly regularly for a while, but uh, it was very obvious that he was spinning off into all the stuff he's spun off into since then. Um open theism and all the rest of that stuff. And, and like I said, hey, the only the only consistent Arminians and open theists, but most of them don't want to go there. Uh, Leighton Flowers um, dreams at night about uh, being an open theist. Um, yeah, that's, that's what he wants to be deeply. <laughs> you can just tell. Um, I love the way he psychologizes me. <laughs> just, yeah. He ignores everything I've said and the arguments I've had with open theists and the debates uh, I've had with them. I guess I just no, he, made those up. Those were parts of my my dreams. Those times that I when I pushed back against my my uh, open theist friends. But uh, that's his fun. his his response is very um, uh, propagandish. It's it's not there, there's not a lot of I, from what I saw. I haven't watched the whole thing yet, but there's not a lot of substance. It's just indignation and, and propaganda. But we'll we'll get more into it. Yeah. Um. I am going to let this run while I go grab something real quick. Um, and so, uh, y'all keep, keep rolling and, uh, just have to wait for me to get back to pause it, but I know you'll want to comment, but let's just keep going. All right. And his job would actually allow him. I, 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 I don't know how he has time to be doing quote unquote evangelism, unless the Texas Baptists think that anti-Calvinism is evangelism. And at that point that explains why he has all the time that he does um, to do that kind of stuff. Uh, But um, anyway, Warren McGrew is the one doing the primary speaking here. Got to unmute. Okay. Um, This is again, ad hominem. He pretends to know my schedule. You know, even if you multiplied the time on screen by three, it's still a fraction of what most people do watching uh, Netflix and sports and everything else. Um, this is something I do on the side. In fact, I'm going to be driving to uh, San Antonio to do our conference, statewide evangelism conference uh, there at uh, Trinity Baptist and uh, look forward to doing that. Um, I don't post anything that I do on evangelism on this because this has been set apart from my evangelism page and apologetics page to keep it separate. In other, in other words, I don't want this stuff to interfere with my important ministries in evangelism and apologetics. And I purposefully separate that out. Um, and my supervisors and the people that I work with are very supportive 
of the work that I do because they recognize that one, it helps to it helps the church to remain focused on evangelism when they're not distracted by and or uh, influenced by uh, dogma that can lead, not always does, but can lead to a less evangelistic fervor, which Calvinists have been historically known to become that way um, in, 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 their, in their history. Now, not all Calvinists are that way, and I praise God for that inconsistency, just like the inconsistency of some of them that believe in uh, infant salvation. I praise God for the inconsistent Calvinist that believes uh, that we should be out there spreading the good news to every single man, woman, boy, and girl as if anybody can be saved and trying to persuade them to, to be saved. I'm, I'm very thankful for those kinds of Calvinists. Um, but, but sometimes it doesn't lead to that. Um, and so just, just wanted to answer that, that particular point. Do you want to comment on that? Either one of you? No, no, I'm good. All right. Let's I, move I, on. And then you've got, well, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jordan. Oh, so, sorry. I just wanted I did, to, I forgot that the other guy was even here. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's easy to do. Who am I even? <laughs> no, for real though. Who, Poor Jordan. I mean, I'm not qualified to be here. Um, no, did, I mean, I got into. People, did you tell people why you're 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 going by? Yeah, that title? yeah. Did, did people understand why they're called Joe. the other guy? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well. In James White's uh, response video, he he labeled it something. You know, responding to Leighton Flowers, Warren McGrew, and that other guy. So, <laughs> I figured it'd be appropriate to, uh, you know, assume the title. Um, but I, I got in some some roundabouts with a few people on Twitter over this because that that was kind of a complaint that came up uh, multiple times from the Calvinists on Twitter was uh, they can't understand why it seems like provisionists, uh, non-Calvinists, their primary focus is just on bashing Calvinism and, and all that. And so uh, the, the point I bring up um, particularly about like Soteriology 101, this platform is that it's 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 specifically been addressed and acknowledged as a platform to focus on this topic of soteriology. Um, and, and the other thing is, is the, the complaint almost seems to be a bit of question begging. It's because if, if we are right, then can, can anybody really make too much content responding to Calvinism? If we are correct and Calvinism is false, then is it really possible to make too much content trying to help people see why it is false and help them not have their lives, uh, you know, dictated by this false theology? And so I just think it's worth pointing out. I just think it's kind of a silly, a silly complaint really to make. Um, I think anytime you hear a, uh, I, I can't think of a, a Calvinist, whether it's Piper, MacArthur or Sproul, who has given a presentation on, God's sovereignty and salvation, who hasn't in the midst of that uh, utilized some sort of dismissive uh, dismissal or a critique of non-Calvinism um, in the midst of that. You know, anytime they're going to present Calvinism or TULIP or again, God's sovereignty and salvation, they're going to in some way try to undermine and undercut the, the free will defense so I just mm -hmm. think it, it goes both ways, and I just think it's kind of a waste of time to, uh, it, it, it sort of just seems to boil down to, I don't like that you're talking against what I believe, and yeah. I don't like that you do it so much, so could you please stop? Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. well and, no, and so it's probably so, not. <laughs> what's so funny about it is that in my work at Texas Baptist, you know, we have staff meetings and everything else, or a big you know, chapel, every Monday morning we have chapel. And uh, there was one particular guy that got up and spoke and regular guy there that we rotate speaking at chapel. And he, he talked about predestination just briefly and then said something about, well, we really need someone to start standing up and really talking about God's love for everybody. And about three people in the room know, know about this podcast that, and they kind of turned to me like, there is and Layton's doing it, you know, kind of thing. Cause he, a lot of people don't even know anything about the, the podcast or what I do that I work with in my building, just because I, it's not like I walk around talking about this. In fact, I, do, I just don't, because I have this outlet, very little time in my real world life do I ever bring up this topic because I, 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 I talk about it so much with the, in this circle, I don't have a need to talk about it much anywhere else. And so I probably talk about it less in my real life than the average, you know, Joe does. Uh, because I, I have this outlet on this page. And so that's what's kind of funny about it. But uh, it, nevertheless, that I, I probably should have even skipped over that section because it's just all uh, it's to the man kind of stuff and it doesn't really uh, hit, hit the point. All right, here we go.
this uh, new kid on the block, Jordan Hatfield, we responded to one of his videos, and, and it's sort of the foundation of all the rest of his stuff, and once that's gone, all the rest of it isn't all that relevant. It's not really anything not new. Um, so you don't do anything else either, Jordan? Is that I guess. Well, can I can I ask everybody watching this, have you seen a video of James White responding to me or any of my videos? Because I, I had no idea that he had responded to me. So I heard this and I went and tried to search for it. So if somebody knows, I would love to see that response, but I don't I don't really know what he's he's talking about. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, I think maybe he might be confusing you with um, what is that other guy? Oh, gosh, <laughs> that I feel other bad. Guy? There's another guy. Uh, there's another guy. You're not. There, you're um, not there's another guy. That other guy. There's an. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's an. There was another broadcaster. Oh, it's driving me nuts now. You're not talking um, about I, Jason, right? No, not Brita. Brita. Um, okay. Yeah, Brita. No, not Jason. Brita. No. Um. Like he has a he has a thumbnail oh. like JMC or something like a black and like a, like um he uses initials Grace Mercy on his, Are you talking about Grace Mercy Gra Raff? Yeah, Grace Worth. Yeah, doesn't he do a broad? Didn't he do a broadcast that he, White yeah. responded to? I think he did. I bet yeah, you maybe that's he thinks we're the same person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he's conflating the two. I think I think maybe okay. is what's happening. Maybe that's that's the true other guy. The well, other guy. Yeah. yeah, I would love if James White would uh, respond to to my my critical error in Calvinism video, but he's featured yeah. in it, but he, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. All right. Here we'll see. Though he seems to think that it is mm, sort of wait weird. a second. Uh, this popped up on my screen and I'm, I'm just like, okay, so that's how you all want me to start this. All right, we'll do it. Um, here is a, it's, it's only one minute long. It's only one minute long. He, how how deranged <laughs> does man's love affair with his autonomy? How well, I know, I know. How deranged is it? It, it gets as deranged as God decrees it to get. That, that's the answer. <laughs> there you go. And, and as much as we laugh about that, that is just a truism yeah. of your system. We will get as deranged and worship our man-centered philosophies and ideas as much as God decrees us to. And we will stop as soon as God decrees us to stop doing it. That, that is the answer to the question. That's why this critique of us is so illogical. Because you're critiquing us for something you believe God decreed unchangeably for us to do. And yet you're still talking to us as if we have control over us doing that which again, he has never answered. He says, it's flattening it out. It's multi-orb diamond shape. You don't understand Calvinism. If you were a real Calvinist, you would never ask that question, but he never actually addresses the, the, how, how illogical that critique is because we will get as deranged as God decreed us to be. If Calvinism is true, just, just why to be very clear. Well, why doesn't white respond to that? but he will take the time to respond to a one minute clip like the one he found on Twitter. That, that well, was one of the things I don't why. why won't he respond to those arguments that are laid out over and over and over well, like again? Well, yeah, Tim, Tim Stratton laid out uh, the free thinking argument instead of answering his free thinking argument. He makes fun of him for using, uh, you know, his analogies to mute movies and things like that and plays it in the clip at the beginning with Tim Stratton instead of, so instead of answering the argument, he will mock the person right. or will deride the person and all those kinds of things. Why? Here's, here's the reason your opponent is more likely to ignore the strongest arguments. And, and, uh, and so the strongest arguments are typically ignored by your opponent. In other words, they're skipped over. And by the way, I have caught myself doing this at times. I have caught myself, um, when, when an argument is presented, and I know it's difficult to answer. Maybe it's because it just takes a long time to answer and I don't want to take the time. And so sometimes I'll skip it because I know it takes a long time. Sometimes it's just a difficult subject. I'll be honest, the doctrine of hell is really difficult for me. And, and when Chris Date brings up annihilationism and those kinds of things, I'm not sure where I land on that. I'm still grappling with it. I've studied some of it, but I, I'd be honest with you, I skip it sometimes. 
because it's a difficult thing to talk about. And it's a difficult thing to, to argue. Um, there are several things like that that I've come across in my own studies where I'll catch myself and I'll, and I'll think, you know what, I'm, I'm purposefully trying to skip that because yeah, that one's a hard one to answer. Um, and so I know that about myself and I recognize it. I'm willing to admit it. I don't know that some people are even, even recognize that about themselves or recognize when they're doing that, but that's our tendencies in these kinds of debates, especially someone who's debating as many people as white is. He's got thousands of arrows being thrown at him every day from all the people that he's critiqued over his lifetime. And so he's getting, he's getting barraged from every which way because he's, you know, you know, you can't stand the heat, don't get in the kitchen and he can stand it because he's just throwing out all kinds of critiques to everybody. So he's always getting stuff. He has to choose which of those things he's going to respond to and answer. And I think naturally he's going to skip the hardest ones and the most difficult ones. Um, now with that said, he, he, at least he does more than a lot of apologists and leading Calvinists do, um, in addressing some of our views. Um, and so I, I give him, you know, credence for that. At least he's doing something. Whereas a lot of the Calvinists just completely ignore our existence, um, and, and, or straw man us completely in their writings or their sermons. Um, whereas white will at least engage on a stage with us and those kinds of things. So. All right. How far does that go? How how much can it twist you? How much how how much can you sit there and hold this book in your hands and say you actually believe it? How far can you go in how you twist what it says? That's Leighton. Is there is there a, is there a book or chapter or verse that says that God sends infants to eternal torment? Do you know of one offhand? Uh, Has, I, if, not, I missed you know that if, one. Do you know if James presents a verse in his rebuttal to us that says that so that we could read that and, and have our minds changed because we're Bible believing Christians who use this as our standard of truth? All I saw him do in this rebuttal is this just wave it around and go, <gasps> mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't see anything there. But how dare you, sir, Mr. McGrew? take objection to the fact that we believe God sends babies to hell. Uh, don't you believe this? Well, you know, it's like, yeah, but you got to open it. You got to show me why you're drawing your, your conclusions. I, I think it's a logical reason that they've, that he's moved from 1987's position that in the position he's now, I, I think it's a logical reason he was pushed. And I think Chris Harris, an, an, another Calvinist <clears throat> spells out the reason he had to leave that doctrine behind. And he says, I don't think all aborted babies go to hell. Um, but to just posit that they go to heaven, which is possibly the case according to God's grace, seems to make abortion the biggest filler of heaven ever. And I actually think White has even referred to this, if I remember correctly, that the reason he doesn't think that all babies uh, who are aborted or who die in infancy go to heaven is, is because logically that would mean uh, aborting them would be the best thing for them. Um, and so... Yeah, when you use that kind of logic to derive your theology, um, and that kind of you know philosophy, philosophy, yeah. then yeah. then you can get to those conclusions, and and I think that's just a bad way to do philosophy. It's it's a it's, it's speculating about things that the Bible is not saying, and then and then drawing your conclusions based upon what you know the post ad hoc rationalizations, those kinds of things that that come from that. Um, yeah, tattered Bible. Thank you for your for your super chat. Um, and then a say sail hammer, uh, Matthew eighteen. Unless you are converted and become like a little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. To me, this is further describes the love of God for children. What do you think? Yeah, and that's exactly what Warren was referring to. Is that you know what what's the difference between a child and an adult? Uh, children are moldable, humble. Uh, remember in the debate that I had with James White, I said that. And then, and then it was a cross examination. So I didn't have a time to rebuttal, but he said, he mocked me for saying that children were humble uh, and even made a joke and everybody laughed at me. I, was like, I, I didn't have a chance to say, but Jesus is the one who's called him humble, not me. And so the, he, he was mocking Jesus without even, even realizing that he was doing it. It's almost kind of like the down from Branson comment that he made because he thought that I was making up the phrase of being down from heaven, even though seven different times in the book of uh, John chapter six, does he refer to being down from heaven and white, I guess, didn't recognize that and thought I was using weird terminology talking about Jesus being down from heaven. Like I'm 
from the South saying down from Branson, you know, or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. I'm just, I'm like, just telling you what Jesus said. He's saying down from heaven, word. not me. Yeah. That's his words. He may be a Southerner. Who knows? I, I don't know, but. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, let's do it again. Sort of how, what we're going to see here. Um, listen to these comments from these three men. And, um, well, here we go. It made mention, Leighton, of like, well, you know, if I'm elect and my children aren't, you know, that's okay. And I just wanted to highlight how that's the same kind of spirit and mindset that the ancient worshipers of pagan deities would engage in when they would sacrifice their children to Baal. Because as long as I get my good crops, I'm willing to throw my child on the pyre. As long as I am being blessed financially, I'm willing to throw my child on the pyre. It's the same mindset where they're like, well, God may have eternally reprobated my child, but as long as I get in to heaven i'm cool with that i don't know about you guys but i mean i've got four children if god's the kind of god that would reprobate your child how do Layton, you have just, the kind of worship and love for that version Layton, of god i Layton, 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 Layton. you're just making god in your own image you just want god to be to be like you you want him to align with your own moral standards and who are you how about, man how about the image god? of first corinthians 13. How, how about that image yeah, of God? How about that? How about it? Yeah, and I, I, I want to comment on that a little bit further because notice where my starting point is. In other words, he always talk about you're starting with man. No, I, I'm starting with the revelation of God through Scripture. God is love. Um, it, it never says God is wrath. It never says God is a lot of other characteristics, but it does say God is love. And so, where where should we go to get the definition of love, if not the inspired Word of God? Is that being man-centered? If if I if I center my doctrine of what love is on 1 Corinthians 13, that it's kind, it's patient, it does not seek its own, it's not self-serving, um, it, it's self-sacrificial. If I if I define love from the Bible, how is that being man-centered? I'm I'm centering it on the the revelation of God that He showed us. Here's what love looks like. Here's, here's, here's what God looks like. Um, and so that, that's the whole point. That's why I was bringing that up. And, and I, and I get frustrated when Calvinists like white, just assume that our definitions are man centered when we are reading the same Bible he is, but we are interpreting it different or saying you're starting with man and we're starting with God. No, we're both starting with the exact same thing. We're starting with a revelation of God and then we're interpreting it. And you're interpreting uh, God to be glorified through his determinism of, of his enemies. And I'm interpreting God as being glorified through the sacrifice for his enemies. Um, so we're both starting with how we understand who God is. And the greatest characteristic of God is, is I think, emphasized in the most climactic event in all of human history. And that is the cross, his sacrifice of himself for his enemies. Um, it's not the, the climactic view of all of history is not God's meticulous divine control over everybody uh, in the world. It's it's about his love for everybody in the world and his dying for everybody in the world. That's what he wants us to know about him, is that he's willing to die for us. And so I'm going to emphasize that because I believe that's what God emphasizes through Jesus Christ. And so anyway, I, I my little soapbox there. But. I would, well, I would think, Leighton, that you're probably starting with assumptions about God's love and character in the same way that White was probably, you know, working with those same assumptions in his 87, 1987 response in that article when he yes. described the idea that God would send infants who had not never committed a sin as an inconceivable thing, inconceivable idea, however he worded that. I, I would assume he was well, basing imagine back that, in 87, he was making that strong statement back in, back in 87, he had a child at home. And so when, when you have young babies at home, you look at life a little bit different. And sometimes you, you forget that when you get away from it, I, I, man, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are high Calvinists with little bitty kids at home who again, and I think that's Warren, what you were kind of getting at any, anybody who can hold their little baby and think to themselves, God may have reprobated this child, but I'm still going to serve. In other words, I'm still going to do everything I can to, to, to please and help and, and, and be, uh, honorable to this this God that I serve, who who may be reprobating my child, um, 
that that's the spirit or the mindset that you are confronting from my understanding. Well, you, you see out of this same mindset, the same teaching that every time a baby cries, it's lying, it's manipulating, it's deceiving the parent. And it's, it's demanding that you bow down and serve them out of this total depravity nature that they have. And I'm not, I'm not being polemical. I've sat through sermons where this was preached almost verbatim to what I just said. When a baby cries, it's lying. So we're taught in, in certain strands of Calvinism that I would argue are very consistent with total depravity, not all Calvinists, but certain strands. They, they teach us to despise the little ones. They teach us that they're vipers and diapers, that they're less than rats, that they are deserving and, and hell bound, that many of them are doomed from the womb, that every time they cry, they're lying, that they're manipulators, and uh, that God has eternally reprobated a, a large number of them. And so we're taught this as as Calvinists in that in that in that particular flavor and variety of Calvinism. And so it 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 harms your ability to see your child. I would say through the proper eyes of a of a parent, you start to you start to resent them. You start to grow cold and anesthetized, and it hurts your understanding of God and your relationship with Him. And then out of that is an outpouring of your relationship with your children and those in your life. It's not universal in all Calvinist flavors, but it is, you know, definitely there in, in some of them. Um, but I, I did want to note that. Yeah, well, well said. It may so, so there you go. One minute of absolute foolishness. Uh, I have no respect for anyone who spoke and what was just said. From what was just said. First of all, Leighton Flowers claims to have been a Calvinist again, demonstrating that's either a bold-faced lie or he is just willing to be so wildly dishonest that it's not even funny. Um, if he was ever reformed, then the only proper response to Warren McGrew's absurdity, because, <laughs> hey, as long as I get in, I'm cool with my children not being saved, is one of the dumbest things I've ever, one well, of the dumbest. And of course, Warren did not say that. Um... Warren did not say that Calvinist parents are saying, oh, as long as I get in, I don't care about my kid. He was comparing the spirit of one willing to worship a God who would reprobate their child with one who is willing to sacrifice their child on the altar for a demon or for a Molech. He was comparing those spirits. It's the same kind of way of thinking is what he was getting to for the higher form of Calvinists that do believe in infant damnation. That's the point he was making. That's the way I understood it. Again, I know in the way he worded it, it's inflammatory, especially when it's in a, in a little a Twitter thing. But at the same time, at least represent what he actually said and, and not paint it as something he didn't actually say. Well, this, isn't, this isn't unique. Yeah, this ahead. isn't unique. As, as he mentioned uh, at the start of this, he had engaged with me quite a bit early on. And we had a back and forth several times. And in one of those interactions, I called him out for misrepresenting me. I said, you're, you're taking what I'm saying, and it's a criticism of your position, and then you're, you're taking that and misrepresenting it as though I'm endorsing this. That's a blatant straw man, and I'm, I'm challenging you and calling you to retract that claim and, uh, and, and, and not straw man me. And he said, well, it's impossible not to straw man you. I have nothing to retract. I'm not going to retract it. And, and so this isn't, unfortunately, this is not the first time Dr. White has misrepresented me. Previously, whether he did it intentionally or not, he did learn that he was misrepresenting me and refused to retract it. I'm sure he's going to learn out of this that he misrepresented me. Will he retract it? I don't know. Um, no, but it is, no, it is, no, he won't. It, it's a pattern, un unfortunately. It's a pattern with Dr. White where he will take what I say, misrepresent it unintentionally or intentionally, but then not not really care. And it kind of reminds me, let's let's bring up this old chestnut of old Augustine and Pelagius. You know, he goes, whether or not Pelagius believed it is irrelevant. The main thing is that I condemned it. You know, that it's it reminds me of that same kind of justification that White does after he misrepresents me. He goes, Well, you know, I still had to condemn it, right? But yeah. uh, I just wanted to note that. Well, that's uh that's good. So I've going ever on. heard anyone make. It's not that it's not a vitally important subject. It's just these men don't treat it with any kind of seriousness at all. It's just, it's, oh, it's horrible. I, I, I've, wow. Uh, I don't even know how to, how to address it. But anyway, 
Leighton's response upon hearing what Warren McGrew said should have been, sir, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm a former Calvinist, and, and while I disagree with Calvinism now, I recognize the absurdity of what you just said. In fact, we're done here and cut it off. That, that would have been the only appropriate thing to do. But instead, he runs with it. He plays with it. Um, so let's, let and then, and then Hatfield just is in, thrown in there for the fun of it. Even though the irony is, the first thing he says is absolutely true. The first thing he says is, yeah, you're just forming God after your own, own conception of creatureliness, which is exactly right. Uh, he's, he's, he's correct about that. Um, and of course, Leighton then runs off to, uh, give us his understanding of what love is supposed to look like amongst human beings, as if that somehow determines how God is supposed to create and things like that. What? Yeah, that was, that, that was, that, yeah. Right there is he where he got to, himself. He seemed to derail. Yeah. I feel like yeah, he was he like, went, oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait, 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 going wait off to what man defines, what, <laughs> what who defines? Yeah. The inspired word of God defines as love. Let, let, yeah. let's that, let that be our image of who God is based upon the definition that God gives us in his word. Well, and see, that's how problem, he characterizes the, it. The problem is, is when God revealed himself in scripture, he had to flatten it out. So when you're quoting scripture now, you're flattening it's it. Be, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's, all right, enough snark. Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, again, the man-centeredness of all of these men is astonishing. And that's why we're never going to agree, uh, because... As God decreed. The reality is... Um, we will never agree until there is a willingness on the part of all to be conformed to everything this teaches and to recognize that this teaches we are creatures, God is our creator, and that massive chasm is only crossed in the person of Jesus Christ, and that is in accomplishing the purposes that Father, Son, and Spirit have already Determined. What, but what let's does that have to do about... with infant damnation? He, he's not even addressing the issue. He's he's waving his Bible. He's pointing to yep. Jesus. He's talking about time and space and flattening it out and multi orb and look at this and don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain over here. What does that have to do with infant damnation, James? No. If you're going to take the time, if you're going to take the time to pull this video up on Radio Free Geneva, you just think that. You would have yeah, well, the honesty if he says to recognize you take there's the, something yeah, take worth it seriously, responding then take it to seriously. Here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was complaining about us not taking it seriously. And watching back through the clip, it's not like we're all giggly and laughing about it. I mean, when I was kind of sarcastically playing the Calvinist part, we might have started smiling a little bit. But w the reason we posted that video and had that dialogue was because we do take it seriously. Uh, it's, it's something that's worth saying. And so it, it's, it is strange to me that he does, Warren. I, I, I didn't realize it until now that you've said that throughout this, this broadcast. It is just a lot of he's waves the Bible and like, well, Calvinism, Calvinism is true. So just don't look over there. And they're all just man-centered and, and arrogant. And when are they going to conform to to the word? It's just kind of a big, long, you know, begging of the question. It's bloviating in hot air. It's indignation. It's not an argument. It's not a refutation. Yeah. It's not a, a, good, a good, a good Calvinistic refutation to that would have been something like, now I get it. Um, I get it. The concept of infants dying and, and possibly being punished is a really difficult subject. And, um, and I can understand how someone might take that and, and really, really be, uh, just uh, abhorrent to it. Um, and especially if I used to like, like he did back in 1987, used to hold to the view. He might even say, you know, I even used to believe it would be absolutely abhorrent for God to punish infants that die. I used to believe that too. And here's why I used to believe it that way. And here's, here's why I don't believe that anymore. And here's the scriptures that teach this and why I believe it's doctrinally sound to hold to infinite infant damnation. Um, and so that that's that would be a meaningful response taking it seriously what white does is like like you said just pearl clenching oh my gosh i can't believe he even brought this up or made it sound the way that he did um instead of actually addressing the topic being being raised 
Um, and that, that, that's what you do when you take something seriously is you address the actual topic being raised because you can't, you can't ignore the fact that that is a difficult pill to swallow if nothing else. The only, the only thing I could maybe say to his defense would be if, if he's under the same assumptions that many on Twitter were that what Warren was at, which I, I find it hard to believe that he was, unless he's, he's just not trying to understand what was being said, but unless he's under the assumption that Warren is actually making the argument that Calvinists believe that one must sacrifice their children's election in order to gain theirs. You know, if, if that's what he thought was trying to be communicated there, um, then the immediate brushing it off of we should know better. I, I suppose that would be the one, the one angle where I'd see where maybe it's, it's, I don't know, but, but I just find it hard to believe that he, he wasn't recognizing that the complaint here is about infant damnation, which he believes in and that that would, he would, should recognize, okay, obviously I, maybe that's not what they're trying to say, but let's just, let's deal with infant damnation. Now. I am that, like you said, Layton, I understand that's a difficult thing. And people listening to this, there's going to be Pete Calvinists listening to this who will likely have some struggle, even just from a pastoral yeah. level to say, there's going to be it's Calvinists who wrestle with that. Maybe Calvinists who believe because I've taught it, who believe me about it, but now they're going to hear that. Let's, let's try to help them, help them come to terms with, with how we work this out biblically. But instead of that, again, it's just a lot of hand waving and and these guys are, are morons. They should know better. Uh, and yeah. and I think he kind of just moves on here. Yeah. Without in the dealing side with chat, it. And, well, yeah, in the side chat, there's questions about, you know, do provisionists or does Leighton believe in original sin? That's kind of like asking, does Leighton believe uh, in predestination? Um, there, there are, it's what do you believe about the original sin? What do you believe about predestination? What do you believe about election? It's not whether or not you believe a particular biblical doctrine. It's like, does, does Leighton believe in the doctrine of the Trinity as, as described by whom? You know, there's, there's many various doctrines of the Trinity out there. Uh, there's very many uh, various doctrines of predestination and election out there. Um, you just can't assume that the Calvinistic version of a particular doctrine is the only version. Because even among uh, the doctrine of atonement, for example, um, different theories of the atonement are are held by various with various people within the Reformed tradition. Like I pointed out before, with Zwingli not holding to original guilt um, and being called a Pelagian by, by Luther, this is a debate even among Calvinists on many issues. And so, when people ask that question, it just it demonstrates to me sometimes. And I'm not to try to be mean to the person who asked that question. You might have been just not informed of this. But I'm helping you to understand there are various doctrines of original sin, even among the Reformed tradition. It's not a monolithic doctrine. And so, yes, we believe that there, there was an original fall, that it had a huge impact on mankind, and that that impact um, still is with us today. There's a curse. There's a fall. There's, there's struggle. There's hardship. There's the curse of the ground, uh, the, the labor pains. Um, the one that he forgot to mention apparently is that, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to be cast out of the garden out of fellowship with me, but you also can't respond positively to me when I incarnate and come to you and I write words that you can read in your own language. And I speak through the mouths of prophets and, 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 and apostles, you won't be able to respond positively to me. He forgot to mention that as a result of the fall, apparently, because when we fell, I don't believe we lost the capacity to respond positively to the word of God. That's the difference, is that Calvinists believe you're born in a condition where you cannot respond positively to his own words. That's not the doctrine of original sin as I've been taught it, and I understand it. Uh, actually, it was what I was taught originally uh, in, 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 in my, uh, my Calvinistic upbringing, uh, not from home, but from the schooling that I got but it's not the doctrine that I believe the scripture teaches today. And so just, just to be clear on, on that particular point. All right. Main thing that was said. Um, Calvinists are just fine with uh, putting their children on the pyre, sacrificing their children in the way that Moloch did as long as they get into heaven. I've never heard anything more stupid in my life. You didn't hear well, me say he that either, that. James. <laughs> it's because he didn't say it. <laughs> you took it that way, and and I and I understand you can you you 
you could uh, try to interpret it with the we- worst way possible, or you could steel man your opponent and say, okay, what was Warren contrasting? And in the same way that when when Wesley, which by the way, it's later in this program that he's listening to, um, oh, uh, what's the pastor's name? The guy he lis- uh, uh, he goes on to play the clip from. Oh, Boyd. Oh, uh, Boyd, yeah. yeah. He plays Boyd and Boyd actually quotes from Wesley talking about how it makes uh, you know God worse than Satan. Mm-hmm. And so he actually addresses that particular argument from Wesley. And so he knows that there are these extreme kinds of claims made based upon the logical implications of the Calvinistic worldview, but he can't entertain the fact that maybe that's what Warren was doing in the context of that quote. That's the whole point. All right, moving along. I really haven't. I'll just be honest. There, that, there is not a scintilla of honesty in what Warren McGrew said. He's not a stupid man, so he's just a massively dishonest man. That's just all there is. It's horrible. So it has to be your character. Your, yeah. Something must be wrong with your character. And he wasn't the only one. Marlon, Wilson, the gospel truth. I saw you, you rascal. People took my statements and they inferred from them like something that was not even said and then uh, take to the internet and call me a liar and impugn my integrity and my character. I'm and, sorry, Warren. This it's, is not fault. Fault. it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. What this is, is if you affirm infant damnation, Again, I can't be strong enough in this. The doctrine you affirm is of the same spirit as those that were willing to sacrifice their children to Molech. I, 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 I see it as reprehensible and antichrist. I, I do not see it as biblical. But that doesn't mean all Calvinists affirm it. It doesn't mean that I'm casting you into the lake of fire and kicking you out of the kingdom. I think you've been deceived into a bad doctrine. So out of my care and compassion for you, your role as a parent, as a child, as a sibling, as a son or daughter of the of, of, of the Savior, of God, I'm, I'm coming in, I'm going, this is a problem. God's better than that. And people go, how dare you, you liar? <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah. uh, you know, all right. Um, I've got pretty thick skin, you know, like I, I can laugh it off. And, you know, you guys want to ride the algorithm and uh, go on YouTube and call Warren a liar and say that I'm calling all Calvinists like, child sacrificers and into, you know, throwing babies in so they can get into heaven, like have, have fun, have do it, but you're not engaging with the substance of my, my point or my criticism, let alone what I actually said. And uh, I think what happened was Jordan's little clip that was supposed to spark conversation did, but people were projecting onto it things that they assumed in the worst possible light possible. And they didn't go and look at the original clip. And when, when you're creating shorts, you go, oh, this will be good. This will have people come and you know, get interested. They'll watch the long form so they can understand the context and engage with the content. And I think what we're seeing here is that's not always the case. Sometimes people <laughs> just go, oh, I hate these guys, you know, and I'm going to downvote and I'm going to attack. And it's like, yeah. You know, so and uh, well, just, there, just there are point. people on both sides who are not real good with nuance. Let's just yeah. let's just be honest. But, but <laughs> yeah, there's both I've, sides of people that are not good with nuance. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. go go mind. ahead, uh, Jordan. I, uh, I cut you well, off there. Sorry. Well, I was just gonna say real quick again, Warren, that what you just said and then the way you phrased it again, what you did in the in the video, you emphasized same spirit and mindset as the pagan idol worshippers. Yes, that's that's inflammatory. It's supposed to be, but I I don't. I, I don't see a distinction in the level of disrespect that should be taken from that than any more than what white you, you, you all listening just heard white. I think maybe a couple times emphasize how man centered we are. Again, we are man worshiping. I mean, I know that's Idolaters, liars, man worshipers. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. And so how, yeah, how, it, it, how is, yeah, if you're going to, if yeah. you're going to get mad at, uh, at Warren, for his comparison, why aren't you getting mad at White at all of his comparisons with us, uh, calling yeah. us, the, you know, and, and 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 at least we're willing to get on and clarify exactly what we mean by it. White just doubles down and keeps doing it, and so there's there's a big difference between our our approaches to this. Um, Vernon is asking the question: Is the quote "There are babies a span long in hell" from Calvin false? I'm not familiar with that particular quote. Uh, Warren, I thought might be. Um, but I, I'm not oh, gosh, familiar I've, with that particular quote. I've heard that before, but I don't know if I can verify the source of that. But I have heard the statement that there are babies a span wide and 
Um, but I, I don't, I don't have the source. I'm sorry. I, I would have to go and yeah. and look and, and try and find that, but I don't have that now. So I can't verify that, but I have heard that, but it could be, it could be from like somebody like a Rolf Barnard or, or some, you know, Calvinist preacher from a bygone era that very few people are familiar with. And he said it and it was falsely attributed to Calvin. That, that sort of stuff does happen sometimes. I, I know the quote exists. I just don't know who to attribute it to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on here. Cannot believe there is no reason to, you know, people say, well, you know, we need to have niceness in our conversation. You can listen to that and then tell me I need to be that way. <laughs> okay. Well, seems only goes one direction, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It does go one direction because Warren gets on here and explains his intention behind the quote and the context of the quote and who he was talking about. When we point out that you misrepresented us with the choice meets comment, for example, or the constant accusations about my job or the constant accusations that I really wasn't a Calvinist or uh, when I correct you about the differing views that we hold to that you, you say that we hold to with regard to being man centered and worshiper idol worshipers in the sense that we're worshiping the idol of free will and all these kinds of things. When I bring correction to those things, you don't get on and, and clarify what you mean by that. You double down with them. You put them uh, to music at the beginning of your broadcast and you continue to hype them up to your listeners. Um, that's the difference between how we're approaching this. Um, and, and that that's what I'm saying is, is not the Christian spirit that we're striving for when we're trying to engage with a very difficult doctrine. And yes, I understand that when something is seen as inflammatory, sometimes it's, in, it's, it's assumed that it's from a nefarious heart. And, and, and maybe there are nefarious reasons for somebody putting out something inflammatory at times in these kinds of discussions. Uh, we can, we can all fall into the flesh on those on that front, but to assume that the person is being intentionally dishonest or nefarious, especially when they were themselves raised in a very high Calvinist world where those kinds of conversations were more, and I've heard it before too, in, in extreme situations where someone will haphazardly talk about a child being reprobate or a, a, you know, who are you to question God? If it's a child reprobate, you know, don't talk back to God kind of a thing haphazardly and kind of off the cuff instead of s considering how hurtful that could be to someone who has recently lost a child. Um, and, and instead of treating it in a haphazard doctrinal way of recognizing that's not the way anybody should, should treat these things because it is a, a serious doctrinal matter. And so anyway, I, that I think there's a huge difference in the way that we have approached people when they disagree with us versus the way in which white approaches them when they disagree with him. Look, uh, let's think about some of God's elect down through history uh, found in scripture. Now, I think we all agree that David was a man after God's own heart, even though he committed sins. It's, uh, we all understand that. And yet he saw what happened with his own children and his heart was grieved and we know anybody who has a scintilla of understanding or a scintilla of honesty knows that reformed people pray for their children now these people then go well it shouldn't have because it created you have to pray look i know you don't understand prayer i don't mm -hmm. i i this makes me suspect that, that perhaps Jordan's take on white not even having a, a, a clue what we were addressing is is quite possible, because I, I don't think he I don't think at first when I heard this I thought he was referencing the child David had with Bathsheba, but I think after watching this a couple of times I think he is referencing Absalom, and so I think perhaps white doesn't understand what was being said at all. I think he's taking this as children, as grown adult children, because if you recall Absalom and David's daughters and that whole thing, these were not infants. These were not young children. These were young men and women uh, who did horrible things and, and suffered the consequences for their sin. And so possibly, possibly this would give us indication if we want to be charitable to white. Let's do that. Let's take the high road. James, you just, you just, you, you blew it. You didn't get the context. You were going off charging a windmill. 
And we weren't talking about Absalom. We weren't talking about David's daughters. We were well, more geared towards he listens to he parody. listens to he he interprets Twitter um, videos and quotes the much much like he interprets the Bible without context. And that's why he got the choice meets thing so wrong. Um, that's why he's not following what you're talking about in this particular uh, quote. Um, instead of taking the time to try to actually learn what his opponent is addressing in context and then and then still attacking it. I, I have no I have no qualm whatsoever with him responding as a Calvinist to what you said. Um, certainly has every right to do that. And and maybe even with some indignation, if they took it to mean something that, uh, that was harsher than what you intended. Um, it, it, did, it was inflammatory. I get that. I, I can understand how someone might have that kind of vitriol kind of, whoa, what is he saying? Kind of reaction to it. But then, then willingly hear somebody out and hear what they're saying and the background from what they were saying and the context that they were talking about and then going, oh, okay, now I can get where you're coming from. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this doctrine of infant damnation and the debate over it and understand why it's so contentious and emotional and hard and difficult. Um, in fact, um, this would be a good time to take a little break from White's uh, video um, because uh, Harris, Chris Harris on the side, I would like you to provide ec evidence that Calvinists say children are reprobate if what by reprobate you mean that they're going to hell. And so... Um, Warren, this might be a good time. I can I can add to the stage your slides if you would like to yeah. demonstrate for Chris uh, that there are Calvinists out there, prominent Calvinists, in fact, that do teach that children there are children who are reprobates going to hell. Um, and and um, and then I'll let you kind of take that, and I'm going to take a, a quick bathroom break while you're doing that, if you don't mind. So no, I'll great. be right back. Yeah. So this is actually a, a quote from Augustine of Hippo. So you know, I, I would argue that uh, infant damnation is derived from Augustinian anthropology. But you see here that he says concupiscence, therefore, is the law of sin, which remains in the members of this body of death. It's born with infants. Um, we can look at, um, oh, what is this? Fulgent Fulgentius of, uh, of Rusp, who I, I referenced earlier. Um, I'm not going to read all of these because uh, I want to be respectful of the time. And I, I don't think Leighton needs that long. <laughs> so, so I'll leave this up for just a minute. But you'll see here that he says that um, without this, uh, he says, uh, uh, hold most firmly and never doubt that not only adults with the use of reason, but also children who either begin to live in the womb of their mothers and who die there or already born from their mothers pass from this world without the sacrament of holy baptism, which is given in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll go ahead and read it. Must be punished with the endless penalty of eternal fire, even if they have no sin from their own actions. Still, by their carnal conception and birth, they have contracted the damnation of original sin. Uh, Martin Luther, he, he noted that a sinner can beget only a sinner who is like him. He said, we sin because we're the sons of a sinner. Uh, Calvin, um, make sure I'm not messing up my, uh, my quotes. I want you guys to be able to see everything here. Uh, he says, our nature is not only... Uh, utterly devoid of goodness, but so prolific in all kinds of evil. It can never be idle that everything which is in man from the intellect, the will, the soul, the flesh is defiled and pervaded with this, that the whole man is in of himself, nothing else than this. This is that Augustinian anthropology. Look at the Augsburg confession. They say that original sin, this, uh, this uh, sin nature is truly sin, even now condemning and bringing eternal death upon those not born again through baptism and the Holy ghost. Again, this is going to condemn those infants that perish without baptism. Um, you can look at the canons of Dort. They were born children of wrath. Uh, we're, we're not uh, willing nor able to return to God, to reform our distorted nature, or even to dispose ourselves to such reform. Uh, Belgic confession, the corruption of the whole nature. It's a hereditary disease where even infants in their mother's womb are infected. Um, it's so vile and abominable in the sight of God, it's sufficient to condemn all mankind. Um, we can look at the 1644 London Baptist Confession. Uh, Since the fall, all are conceived in sin, brought forth in iniquity, children of wrath, servants of sin, subject of death. In the state of our nature, we're without relation to Christ. And all mankind, thus being fallen, become altogether dead in sins and trespasses and subject to the eternal wrath of the great God by that transgression. You can look at the Midland Confession. Um, we're defiled from the womb. Therefore, consent not with those who 
hold that God has given power to all men to believe to salvation. Again, this is an attack on our God-given faculties and our state at conception. Uh, you can look at Calvin in the Institutes, Book 2, Section 8. He says, uh, the apostles most distinctly testify that death passed upon all men for all that have sinned. Again, he's taken a Romans uh, 5.12 reading that Augustine would have affirmed based on a faulty understanding of the Latin. But that is that uh, are involved in original sin and polluted by its stain. Hence, even infants bringing their condemnation with them from their mother's womb suffer not for another's, but for their own defect, the state in which they were created. For although they have not yet produced the fruits of their own unrighteousness, they have the seed implanted in them. Nay, their whole nature is, as it were, a seedbed of sin, and therefore cannot but be odious and abominable to God. That's right. God makes babies that are abominable to him. Hence it follows that it is properly deemed sinful in the sight of God, for there could be no condemnation without guilt. Um, Institutes Book 4, Section real, 17. Real, real quick. I'm just jumping here. Irresistible truth. Derek is on the side. Warren even isn't even backing up his claim. Yeah, original sin. Where is it saying babies go to hell? He's presupposing and reaching. Um, I, I don't know how much more clear some of these quotes can be. Um, the, even the one that I provided at the very beginning from Van Dyke where I showed you, let us now be candid with ourselves and even with our opponents. Historic Calvinism does include what Calvin himself calls the horrible decreum that by election and predestination of many nations with the infant children are irretrievably doomed to eternal death. I, I don't know how you are any more clear eternal death, unless you mean maybe an annihilationist can get away with this concept of saying that the, the, the infants are annihilated and not sent to hell. Um, but that that's certainly not what they say. I, I, I don't, I, we even played it earlier from, from the reformed Baptist and from white himself saying that the there, if they're regenerate children, elect children that are regenerated, they go to heaven, but the, the rest are doomed and go to hell. I, I don't know wh why, why, why somebody's not seeing that. I, I, I don't understand that. It's willful. Mm -hmm. I, I know Derek, it's willful. Um, not all Calvinists are willful. You know, some people are going to read this and go, oh, I need to look into this. I've had some Calvinists that I've interacted with. They go, you know what? I think to be consistent, I need to affirm infant damnation now that I've studied it. Right. So you, you know, I don't think you can get away from this doctrine. Uh, Harris, who asked the original question, has has said a couple times that the, the question was misunderstood. And I, th I think what he was intending to ask is, uh, name a Calvinist who would identify a reprobate child. Um, oh, well, it, no, it they, they are be, very maybe, clear. Yeah. Yeah. They're very clear to not to say we know who the elect are and who the reprobate are. No, no Calvinist is ever going to say, oh yeah, that child over there, he's a heathen, man. That kid's going to hell for sure. You know, none of them are going to do that. Obviously. <laughs> I want, Chris, what, Chris, why would you even ask that? Yeah. I don't understand. That's, why, would, yeah, that's, why, why would you even ask that, that question? Not we, the, you know we don't believe that. That's not the point being made. Yeah, that's not the point yeah. that anybody is trying to make here. So I don't understand the purpose of the question. Yeah, the fact that you would even say any infant or aborted baby that dies would even potentially be punished in hell. That's what we're confronting here. We're not trying to say that any Calvinist out there is is rejoicing that their kid might be, you know, damned to hell. Oh, yay. We're, obviously, we're not saying that. Um, obviously, we're not trying to, to accuse Calvinists or just relishing in this infant damnation thing or anything like that. What we, we are we are going over and talking about a, a doctrine that has been debated even among reform people. James White even talked about him and Justin Peters being at the same conference and both of them having a differing view of this very doctrine. And, and the fact that some Calvinists don't even want to recognize that the debate exists or that there's a problem with it or that it's difficult doctrine just goes to prove that some people aren't willing to be objective when it comes to these things. They, they assume nefarious intentions. They become willful in their unwillingness to listen or to engage and, and in those kinds of situations, sometimes um, sometimes you just need to step away from those conversations because the person's not a good faith interlocutor. 
Um, and, and I, and some people have asked me and I've had to struggle with this is why do you continue to engage with white then? Because that's exactly who he is and what he's become. And to, and, and I have, I have to pray about that, to be honest with you. Um, but I really do believe that because of white's influence as one who shares the stage with many notable Calvinistic, uh, scholars and pastors, that he has a range of influence that's worth me engaging with the banter and I think the the low level argumentation, the fallacies that he employs, I'm willing to engage it with him because it is a gift that keeps on giving, and people are flocking to understand provisionism and God's love for people through that man. And I thank God that He's willing to engage with provisionists. I thank God that He's willing to debate us on stages because every time He does so, we get a host of new people coming to provisionism and coming to understand God's love and provision and recognize the the uh, f- uh, faulty views of Calvinism. And so I thank God for James White for that reason. And he's that's the reason I continue to engage with someone who is really not a good faith interlocutor when it comes to these discussions. There are a lot better representations, better representations of Calvinism out there than James White. Hear me say that. And, and I know Chris Date and others would be appreciative of me saying that because they don't want to be represented uh, solely by someone like James White. Uh, not that Chris has ever said that. I'm not putting words in Chris's mouth. I'm just saying, generally speaking, I've heard from many Calvinists over, over the years who don't want to be solely represented by someone like James White because of the way he represents himself uh, and Calvinism for that matter. So I'm just saying all that to be really clear that we're, we're, we're engaging these topics because we do believe they're important and we're willing to engage those topics with white, not because we think he's a, a good representation necessarily all the time, but because in doing so, we are uh, highlighting for a lot of people in the audience, things that need to be highlighted and talked about. So sorry to interrupt you there, Warren. Uh, no, no, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate all that. Um, you, you notice here, he says uh, that some are saved at this age of infancy, uh, which entails that some are not. Um, you know, and I think that's drawn out from the context of the previous uh, quotes that we've looked at. He says uh, in his um, his commentary on Ezekiel 18.4, Calvin says, as far as it relates to young children, they seem to perish not by their own, but for another's fault. But the solution is twofold, for although sin does not appear in them yet, it is latent, since they carry out uh, carry about with them corruption shut up in their soul, so that they are worthy of condemnation before God. Uh, on Institutes Book Three, Section Twenty Three Seven, he says again, "I ask, how is it that the fall of Adam involves so many nations with their infant children in eternal death without remedy, unless that it so seemed meet?" Uh, to God, uh, so, me, yeah, to God. Here, the most loquacious tongues must be uh, dumb. The decree, I admit, is dreadful, and yet it is impossible to deny that God foreknew what the end of man was before He made him, and foreknew because He had so ordained by His decree. Should any one here inveigh against the prescience of God, He does it rashly and unadvisedly. For why pray? should it be made a charge against the heavenly judge that uh, he was not ignorant of what was to happen. So here, here you see it's this dreadful decree that uh, God has uh, ordained Adam's fall and that so many nations and their infant children suffer eternal death. This is not simply mortality. This is annihilationism. This is eternal conscious torment. Uh, that's what he is affirming here. Um. Here's some uh, famous uh, Calvinists you guys might recognize. Washer has claimed that uh, we're born evil and hating God, that the only thing keeping a child from murdering his father is his inability, that he has a murderous rage. Uh, Vody has called newborn infants vipers and diapers and said that you can cage evil, but you can't, uh, you can't control it. You can't tame it. Uh, Jonathan Edwards has stressed the damnability of infants saying it is most just, exceedingly just, that God should take the soul of a newborn infant and cast it into eternal torment. And John MacArthur, while he rejects infants going to hell, has stated the very act of having sex and creating babies is itself sinful because you're creating sinners. So he's far from consistent on that. Um, For the Roman Catholic in the uh, audience, this was the document that I was referencing on October uh, 2004. uh, Pope John Paul assigned the uh, International Theological Commission 
um, the task addressing limbo and, and all of that. But um, I've got more quotes here from Anabaptists and, and whatnot, but I think that kind of shows enough to um, can, you know, can, you can you clarify that John MacArthur quote there? Yeah. Yeah, that, because MacArthur was... MacArthur does believe that all infants that die do go to heaven. He argues that point. You want to open and that, so... add that back to the the screen. I'm sorry. Let... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So, in in a video I have on my original sin series, uh, you can hear him in his own words saying this. This is kind of long. I'll summarize it. But he says, um, in the case that's made all throughout Scripture, um, that when they offered their children to pagan idol work. Uh, uh, to Molech, their babies setting them on fire, incinerated. Jeremiah called it the death of the innocent, right? So I've already taught on this, and I've not said all Calvinists are one-to-one -one Molech worshipers. I've actually appealed yeah, these to are, John By the Gordon. way, these are, these are Warren's slides from another teaching he's done previously. So this is proving what, what Warren's doing is demonstrating the fact that he was not trying to lump all Calvinists into one group but that he's actually taught what MacArthur and other more modified or lower Calvinists have taught on this subject. So yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have video series, teaching series, articles, blogs, tweets. Um, and here you see MacArthur pointing to Jeremiah, calling it the death of the innocents. He said, God even refers to those sacrifice babies as innocent. He says they're not guilty. And then he appoints to Christ in Mark 10, blessing children and says, this is something God never does to unbelievers. So he says he thinks the case is made all throughout scripture that the, the young and those that are uh, mentally um, uh, challenged, uh, they automatically go to be with the father. And I, 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 when I saw this, I was like applauding going, amen, amen, MacArthur. Like this is, this is brilliant. I don't think it's consistent with total depravity. But I don't think total depravity is true. I think this is. So I'm going to point to those teachings where MacArthur is teaching what I believe to be right. And I'm going to show why I think he's right. I'm going to point to those teachings that I think are inconsistent with his rightness and, and try and draw that out. But yeah, I mean, I've taught on this for years now. And so for people to come in and take what I've said and say that I was applying it to all Calvinists, they actually know better. I mean, in the case of Marlon, I've argued this on his channel, you know, so like... To call me a liar after I've argued this on his channel and I have all this teaching is is perhaps um, perhaps his memory has failed him. But um, uh, and then I, I point to the the Eastern Orthodox their conception of ancestral sin. Um, I've got tons of quotes here from the Anabaptists. I have a teaching series on uh, Jewish anthropology, and um, you know I try and, to show how Augustinian uh, views of sin and human nature are. Mm. A, a kind of the lone lonely fact out there. And it's based on a yeah. faulty interpretation of scripture. Mm. Go ahead, Jordan. Good stuff. No, I, was, uh, I, I yeah. he, he was in the middle of saying what I was about to ask him about. So, so no, okay, just that, yeah. that there's a, there's a Augustinianism is, is a little bit kind of in its own corner is, is mm -hmm. the point you're, you're trying to make. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Have the slightest interest in accurately representing the other side, because you don't have any interest in us listening to what you have to say. This is just for your own people. It's the red meat or the chosen meat or what are the prime meat or whatever. Huh? Yeah, choice. Thank you. The choice meat. You're just throwing red meat out and it's to get clicks and stuff like that. I, I... The irony of all ironies. Um, I know. You're not that willing was, to listen. Yeah. You're not willing to listen to other side. When he, even in this own video, we might get to it where he says, I don't listen to these guys. I don't listen to them. He brags about the fact that he didn't listen to my program, that he gets little snippets talk. He, he goes he goes out of his way to say, no, I don't listen to Flowers anymore. I don't listen to the McGrew guy anymore. You know, people will send me little clips here and there, and I'll, but I don't listen to him anymore. We listen to everything White has said, as painful as it sometimes is, when he addresses provisionism because he sends people our way all the time and we and we we respond because we're helping people to understand what provisionism actually teaches versus the straw men he keeps painting so we listen intently to everything he says i've got his books right here with markings all throughout his books every page looks like this right here i have gotten transcripts from every one of his debates and teachings on john chapter 6 to prepare for my debate printed out right over here um, so 
I mean, I, there's, I'm listening and, and printing it out and marking it up and writing it down and, 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 and trying to understand his point, finding inconsistencies with his view in this year versus his view this year and the changes and wondering if he knows he even changed his views. Um, the, these kinds of things. Um, I, I, I honestly think I probably know better what James White has said about John six than James White does at this moment, because I've read it all and seen it all in context in my preparations. And so to say, I'm not willing to listen is the height of hypocrisy. It's not irony. It's hypocrisy to say that we're not willing to listen when we are playing his broadcast in his own words, dissecting it, trying to understand it. Oftentimes, even though he doesn't deserve it, trying to still man the things that he says to the best of our ability in order to confront his views. So I'm, I'm just being very, very, very clear about this point. Um, White is not willing to listen to us or understand us. And the, the height of hypocrisy is for him to even mention the choice meets comment when he knows full well, because he's been shown the context that he took that out of context and misapplied it and continues to play it in his opening to this very uh, uh, Radio Free Geneva that he just started over and over again, hyping this concept and idea that I believe that people who believe in the gospel are better. They're, they're, they have to be morally better people because it's the only way they would believe in the gospel. When we're the ones who are denying that, we're saying anybody, even the most immoral person can believe the gospel. Anybody can believe the gospel. They're the ones who are saying you have to be regenerated, ontologically changed into a higher quality individual one with eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that's not corrupt. You're the ones who think that they have to be a better quality person. We're the ones who are saying it's not based upon your quality. It's based upon the quality in the one in whom you trust. And so you can be a bad quality human being, a horrible, bad, immoral person, but you believe in God, you believe in Christ, and you're credited with his quality. It's his righteousness. And how many times have we made that clear? Yet, what does he do? He continues to double down, use the choice meets comment as if I believe that people have to be better quality in order to believe in Jesus. And that is an outright lie. And he knows that. And he's going to be called out on that live in a debate. And I will ask him to, to clarify why he continues to do that when he knows that that was not what I said or have ever believed or promoted. And then I'll force him to defend what I think he's projecting onto us. The concept and idea that people have to be turned into better quality humans through regeneration in order to believe the gospel. He's the one, ironically, yep. who believes in choice meat, a better quality piece of meat to believe in Jesus. You have to be picked before you're born and turned into a better quality piece of meat. And then you'll believe in Jesus. We don't believe that. We believe anyone can believe in Jesus because God made us that way. Anyway, that's my soapbox. So <laughs> we'll move along. Any, yeah, anybody else want to jump on, on that? No, no, I'm, I'm just interested. I'm just interested to hear if he actually does acknowledge that he doesn't listen to these guys in the same video because I don't think I caught that when I was listening to it. I think he says that about Warren. Mm -hmm. yeah, doesn't he? Warren yeah, he, later, no, later on he says, I don't to listen to them. I don't yeah, listen I to listening them. to yeah. McGrew a long time ago. Okay. And I'm like, well, I see, yeah, yeah, he, he never yeah. really did, you know. Well, and he said that about me several times, I, not in this video, maybe, but I've he heard said him, that. Uh, yeah, yeah I've heard him say that about you. Yeah, I know he said that about you. So it's it it was it, yeah, it's very ironic. Not ironic. It's hypocritical. There's a difference. Between, yes. I learned the difference between irony and hypocrisy. Yeah. And I, yeah. I've been saying it's ironic, and it's not ironic. It's it's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy. Yeah, it sounded nicer than saying hypocrisy. So I went <laughs> no, with that one. But, but that, you're that, right. No, that's right. that's why I used to make that mistake of using ironic, but it, it's actual it's actual hypocrisy. So all right. yeah, all right, but. If you had honesty, then you would never have played along this this, and you would have said, look, Calvinists believe that God ordains the ends and the means. The means is what takes place in time. That means our uh, striving for biblical justice versus man's perversion of justice, our striving um, for freedom, so that the gospel can be proclaimed to people. All these things are good things that we are to strive for because we don't know what God's decree is. We know what the end of it is going to be. We don't know how. One, I think I made this point earlier, but I want to stress this again. If you believe that God has from all eternity ordained that your child will be reprobate, appealing to the ends and the means does not help you because every time you in good faith teach your child about God, 
God is using that to drive your child into reprobation. So he is using you to reprobate your child. And you don't have to know that for that argument to be true. Yeah. In other words, you don't have to know whether or not your child is reprobate or not in order for that idea to be true. In other words, whenever he keeps saying, but we don't know who the elect are. We don't know who the reprobate are. As if that answers the argument, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You, You don't have to know whether your child's reprobate or not. If it's the truth, it's the truth, regardless of whether you know it. And so every time White says, oh, well, we just don't know who those people are, as if that answers the question, or says, oh, well, the ends, um, God determines the ends as well as the means. That doesn't answer the question either. Of course, God determines the ends as well as the means on determinism, because the ends and the means are determined. So what? that's just a restatement of, I believe in determinism. And, and so it's not, it's not an answer to the, to the problem. All right. To get there, we know that everything along the way is going to glorify God in the final analysis, but we are given God's prescriptive will. His law tells us what his character is like, and we know that we are to instruct our children. We know that we are to pray for our children. We know that we are to to do everything we can to make sure that they hear clearly the message and that we uh, represent that message in how we live our lives. I, I, I one of the most but we also believe that God could, with one of our children, we don't know that he is, but he could be preventing one of our children from listening and learning from what we're teaching them by, by decreeing for them to be born in a state of total inability where they cannot willingly believe what we're teaching them. And they will hate God regardless of the efforts that we put into this, regardless of all the things he's told us to do, because God is actively reprobating them in the sense that, in other words, the guys, I, I understand that some Calvinists want to do that more of the passive passing over kind of thing. But if, if God has decided that the fall results in everyone being born, unable to believe his truth, then how is he any more or less controlling over the nature of man from birth as he is over the nature of man from new birth? He's just as in control of both of those natures, right? Yeah. I don't see a, a way around that. Mm-hmm. No. All right, Harris, Chris Harris, uh, thank you for the super chat. He says, could you define reprobation, what reprobation is, whether it's a positive action of, of God or not? And that's kind of what we were getting to just now. Um, if if God has decreed in eternity past that everyone born under the fall or even after eternity, I mean, it doesn't have to be an eternity past for him to do this. If God decided at any point that the result of the fall would be not only labor pains, not only the toiling of the soil, but I'm also going to make it to where their nature is such from birth that they will be unable to willingly, they're unable to want to accept my appeals to be reconciled from their fall. That is what what I understand to be reprobation on the Calvinistic system, is that they're left in that condition that God decreed them to be from birth. So it's not by accident that they're born without the moral ability to respond positively. That happens by purpose, by God's decree. And so no Calvinist is going to just say, well, that's just, um, White refers it to as a default position. Um, John MacArthur refers to it as being programmed to believe lies, pre-programmed to believe lies. Um, there, there are many quotes from Calvinists that, that acknowledge that all things are decreed by God, which would include, yes, the, the corruption of man's heart to be such from birth that they can't respond positively to the appeals of God to be reconciled from their fallen condition. And I don't know how you can make an argument that that's not God's doing and that he's not just as active or in control over that as he is over the regeneration of the elect. I, I don't know how you get around that um, in, a, in a cognitively you know, rational way, at least. Um, and so uh, feel free to, to comment on that and figure, well, I was gonna say, figure if, that if, out. Uh, if Harris is, a, I think that's who asked that, if Harris is a, classical theist, then he's also going to affirm actus puris. And I don't know how he's going to say there's any potential or lack of potency with the act of God. So, there, you know, anything that comes about is directly as a result of, a, of an action, an intention of God. So it, I, I, don't see, I don't see any road for a Calvinist to say reprobation, even if God is creating them in that state and then choosing not to. That's still... It goes back to its origin with God. It's not a, a maverick molecule. Uh, yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
Yeah. That's why I unmuted myself to say rogue molecule, but there you go. Yeah. 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 All right. Beautiful things I've seen of late. I I decided not to retweet it just because it would have I there's just people out there that wouldn't understand it. But um my daughter, I don't know if you saw this, Rich, but my daughter tweeted Okay, wait, Chris Harris made a comment here. I, I want to get into this because I do, I do believe Chris is a well-intending guy for the most part. He and he and I go back and forth over the years and the conversations I had, even though I, he's, he, you know, uh, he's a Calvinist and I, we disagree with each other. Obviously I think he means well. And so here he's saying the decree of God has no force on creation. Now I, I don't know what, what he means by that necessarily. Hmm. Um, but if God decrees, whatsoever comes to pass and he decrees that the result of the fall is that everyone's heart is with a moral inability as edwards puts it as a moral corruption of the heart to where they will automatically pre-programmed default whatever word you want to use there all words of calvinist by default will always reject the gospel because of their default role how is that not a force upon creation I, I, again, I, how do you define force um, that, that would be in such a way that that wouldn't be a force any more so than the force of um, regeneration, new birth, would cause the, the will to want to receive Christ? How is it the first birth isn't a cause, a force upon the natural man to reject the things of Christ? Warren, uh, yeah, Jordan, so is my think, logic flowing there? I think I think what he's trying to do is focus on this word force in order to kind of obfuscate the position. Maybe not intentionally, but that's I think that's what the end result is. So if you say the decree of God is impotent on his creation, that that's that we're using synonyms here, and I think that conveys what he's really trying to say. And I don't think that is representative of his own belief. I don't think he believes that the decree of God is impotent on, over creation. It's a well, fact. I know. I know. Even Bing, Bing Yang. Yeah says it's a causal it's a yeah. causal determinism i mean it's a cause so if something is a causally determined how is that not a force um I think, i'm I think looking at the word i think what he's loading into this is violence and that's one of the key words that you often see in the creeds and confessions that no violence is done by the decree of god upon right. these they're not dragging you against them. your will they're not dragging yeah, you no. against your will he's changing your will and so, but 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 that's within the definition of force. Yes. If you if you manipulate a person's will in such a way to make them do what they naturally wouldn't want to do, that is a, a definition of force within not only philosophical dictionaries but just you know Webster's and everywhere else. And so a strength, or an inner, a strength or an energy yeah. as an attribute of physical action or movement, a coercion, a compulsion, especially with the use of threat or violence, that would be the one that I think, I so say they're not saying by threat or violence, but even that you could say, well, yeah, the wrath of God, I'm threatening wrath on you if you don't do this. So that that's a, a force, like a gun to your head. Well, you could put hell to somebody's head too, right? I mean, I, I don't know how that's not a, a, a force if you're not giving someone the ability to choose to love and respond to you uh, again, I, I'm not sure why why he has a problem with uh, the word force. If if uh, God is ultimately manipulating your your motives, I think the the question should, I would just ask is why why is he trying to avoid that sort of language? You know, because you do have the R.C. Sproles who will define it in the terms like Warren just just brought up. Not, there isn't a rogue molecule, or you'll have desiring God. Piper and and whoever that other pastor was who said the original quote, but just very clearly, uh, forthrightly communicating that God is, you know, no sin takes place that isn't directly the result of, of you know, God's, I can't remember the exact language, but God causes it or ordains it. And so I, I just think I don't, it feels like to me that question just represents somebody who's trying to avoid, again, the logical implications that puts God as the ultimate source, the ultimate cause, uh, the author, if you want to use Calvin. Um, and, and it just, I think the, the question is, is warranted to ask, why are you trying to avoid that? Just embrace it. Um, like, like these others seem to do. 
Well, you've got you've got RC Sproul if you, who famously, and I'm not going to get you demonetized, Layton, so you don't need to worry here. But RC Sproul famously referred to it as the holy R word that sounds like a word in grape juice, the holy grape juice of the soul. That's how RC Sproul referenced this. Um, this if that doesn't convey or denote some force or action that is effective acted upon the other agent. I don't know what is, but I think, I think by couching it in the term of force, the, the, the goal here is to obfuscate and um, kind of bury and, and, and equivocate over what that means. And I, I don't think that's, I don't it's, know if that's charitable, it's really just, I, don't, I don't think that's really the right way to go about the disagreement. Yeah. I suppose it's, it's to get away from the, any idea that, you know, are, are we saying that God grabs hold of the heart and forces it to move in one, in every direction that it does, uh, uh, you know, in, in a forcible controlling way like that. And of course not, that's not how Calvinists would, would, uh, you know, describe it, but as ter in terms of who, what ultimately is the ultimate cause of that could, could, could things have gone any other way? And obviously no, because, and the answer as to why is because that's things happen precisely as God wants them to happen. And so whether you use words like force or ordain, I, you know, the ultimate implications are the same. And, and, and right. that is that response. That, that's often, I'll point that out. I'll say, okay. Them. Yeah. I'll point that out. Sometimes I say, let, let, let's pretend he did force them. Um, let's, let's pretend, you know, for example, when Cain didn't bring the right sacrifice, let's pretend that it wasn't just Cain's desire not to bring the right sacrifice by decree. Let's pretend that God actually sent an angel and tied him to a tree to where he couldn't bring the right sacrifice, even if he wanted to. Then would you question God and his justice? And when, what keeps you somebody from saying to you, oh, who are you to question God if he wants to tie somebody to a tree? and keep them from bringing the right sacrifice, who are you to question God, oh man, if he wants to do that to his creation? Because there's no meaningful difference between tying them to a tree and somehow decreeing their desires and nature to be such where they couldn't want to do otherwise. And they had to, in other words, by, um, by nature of decree, by the nature of what they were decreed to be and to do, they were, they were in a sense tied to the tree in a, in a, physiological sense, if you will, or a, um, a, a spiritual sense, if you will. In other words, you're just as unable to bring the right sacrifice if you're tied to a tree as you are if you're decreed not to be able to desire to bring the right sacrifice. And 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 thus the same objection is, is entailed in both of those scenarios. If he's tied to a tree, the same objection is a right, raises up as if He's decreed uh, in eternity past not to be able to have the desire to do to bring the right sacrifice. Um, either one of them evokes the same uh, objection, and 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 therefore you have to give a meaningful distinction between those two inabilities. And I have not seen one yet. Um, just just to uh, um, respond to some of these super chats. Thank you, Amber, for uh, that super chat. He says I, she says I gave my dad a copy of Potter's Promise. Thank you. I appreciate that. He wasn't comfortable with Arminianism or Cal Calvinism. He's now calling himself a provisionist, and he brought uh, your other book and books by John Lennox. Thank you. Yeah, John Lennox books one of the one of the best. Um, uh, Determined to believe by John Lennox is a really good one that uh, promotes uh, provisionistic. He doesn't use the term provisionism because he doesn't know probably about provisionism or didn't you know need, about it. You when need he to get that. him on here, Layton. That, that we've, would be we've tried. The, uh, we, we've tried. Yeah, he's a we're, big, we're, he's we a still trying. Busy, busy man. Yeah. yeah he's, he's busy. Um, chaos and order. Thank you for your super chat. He said, I'd like to ask Calvinist, even if total depravity is true, what benefit does it serve to a person's faith? In other words, um, I guess what's the positive or reason somebody might teach total inability in, in specific. I see the benefit of teaching depravity in the sense of understanding our sinful inclinations our our selfishness are bent towards, um, sin and selfish selfishness. I, I understand the spiritual benefit of that. And I think what chaos and order is asking, what is the spiritual benefit? Even if, if inability is true, you were born unable to believe the Bible. What benefit is there in telling people they're unable to believe the Bible? I, I think that's a, probably a pretty good question. Is, is there any practical good yeah. uh, that, that comes from that? Um, 
Yeah, not not and not prior to regeneration. Like, it would do no good. The only the only thing they could argue would be post regeneration. They learned that you know where they came from, perhaps if that was the argument they might move. But I I like his his question. Yeah. Layton, can ahead, we ahead, ad Jordan. address? Could we address the the comment by Paul Gonzalez? Because I've seen this similar thing. I don't know if it's been the same person, but I've seen this multiple times. People are asserting that James White is demon possessed or controlled by Satan. Um, I, I, I suppose I get the sentiment, but I, I just feel like that's that's a bit unhelpful. And, and I don't think anybody here is suggesting or, or would want to suggest that Dr. White is, is possessed by the devil. Um, and I just, yeah, I don't know. I just think that's unhelpful um, yeah. in, in bringing this exchange forward in any positive way. Well, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. the inflammatory guy. So I would say the closest I would get would be that he's possessed by a faulty ideology, but yeah. uh, you know, I might, I might say he's possessed of the idea of Calvinism and maybe struggles to interact with what we're saying, but that can happen to anybody. We can get possessed yeah. of a certain ideology and struggle to see another perspective. I'm well, okay and, with, with maybe arrogance and pride is at play there, but I, <laughs> okay. you know, I, well, I and, think and the reason, the... and the reason that so oftentimes I talk about how, how it's not helpful to shout down Calvinist as being heretics and possessed by demons or whatever else, these kinds of things is because one, one, I don't believe it's true. That's the biggest one. But two, even if it were true, kind of like the question for even if it were true, it's not gonna, it's not helpful. <laughs> so, in other words, uh, I I can't possibly know <laughs> what possesses a person. In other words, I don't assume a nefarious intention upon those who disagree with me theologically. Um, I try not to anyway, um, and, it, and sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard not to assume a nefarious, a, a negative intention on those who disagree with your theology. Um, and it takes sometimes, uh, you know, getting to know somebody like spending time with them, asking them questions, getting to know where they're coming from. Uh, like I've done with Chris and he has uh, thank you again for your, another super chat there, Chris. He says the difference between the decree and Providence is the former is ad intra and the latter is ad extra. The latter includes secondary causation, freedom, and contingency. All right. Well, we're, we're getting into the, the, the weeds on that one. Um, I'm assuming he's referring to, um, uh, with, with secondary causation, what, what, what is secondary causation in a world where the God decrees whatsoever comes to pass is God permitting someone to act freely. And that's what you mean by secondary causation, because secondary causation works in my world in my vocabulary very well, because a second person is causing it. There's another agent causing something. That doesn't exist on monergism, especially no rogue molecule mol uh, uh, theistic determinism. Everything, even the secondary causes, the, the means that lead to an end, those are decreed by God, are equally as causally determined by God. So to re reference secondary causation is to butter the bread on our table, okay? You're buttering the bread on the provisionist table or the Arminian table, either one, the free will advocates table, and then claiming it as your own, but without consistently or logically demonstrating how on a world where God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, including the secondary causes, that determinism isn't active and by force or whatever you want to call it, whether it's force or, you know, ordained or decree or any of those kinds of things. And so again, it, it's impossible to have these kinds of discussions. I, I know Chris, uh, with, um, you're just chats, but, um, I, I, we've we've gone around and around about all those those things a dozen times before, and so all right. Um, here we well, go. White was about go, to tell us about a letter or a post that he got from his daughter, thanking him for raising her in the way that she should go, and how much this uh, blessed him. Um, but you know that's that's kind of a unique perspective. There are Calvinists out there whose children have grown up and have uh, forsaken the faith, and God decreed according to Calvinism both of those outcomes. So it's not, I don't think it's, I don't think it's helpful for White to point to his own daughter and her profession of faith as a solution or an answer for God decreeing even adult children not to believe, let alone defending this doctrine of infant damnation, because 
it, it, it's it, it's not a one to one comparison. So I, I don't think it's very helpful. But that's where he goes. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I'm not going to do it. I, I mean, I was going. I I was thinking about how to respond by by talking about like heaven forbid summer. You know, I, I don't even want to put that into the universe, as they say. Not that yeah. I, I think I can speak something. Just because I, I, when it comes to my kids, um, man, like the mama bear kind of thing, papa bear kind of thing. You want to defend your babies at all costs, and um, and and I don't want to put myself in the situation where I'm having to defend my own children or their their choices and their lives, and so I'm, I, I try to avoid that with John. People brought, brought up John Piper's kid a lot. I try to avoid that um, just because I I just don't want to bring family stuff into this. But taking it away from J James White and his own family, if if you just have any random Calvinistic leader out there who has a child who is loving the Lord and is following the way that they were, they were raised. Praise God for that. Right. But what if that child ends up abandoning the faith and, and becomes an internet atheist that is deriding. And I don't wish that upon any Calvinist or anyone for that matter. But what if, what if that's taking place? Then what's your answer? then what do you do with that? I raised them in the way they should go. Um, I did everything I could. You have to conclude if they end up in that rebellion and dying in the rebellion, you have to end up concluding the God that I love and worship, the God that I'm giving my life to is the cause, ultimately the cause of my child doing that and is, was rejected before they were ever born, was not loved by my maker that I've served and I've strived to do what he's asked me to do. And that to me is what's so untenable about the doctrine. Um, it, it, I don't think it can be rationally. Um, I, I think there has to be a cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. there in order to still worship a God you believe is doing that to someone you innately love as a parent, as much as a parent loves their child. Um, because I don't think without that cognitive dissonance, and it would have to be a gracious cognitive dissonance. In other words, it's a grace God gives Calvinists who give them the capacity to worship a God they believe is doing that to their child. And that, that again, it doesn't compute with me. Uh, I don't, I don't, it, it, I, I don't, fath I can't fathom. I can't fathom that. If, I, I think it was I Dave Free yesterday. Oh, I was just going to say, I agree. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to wrap your head around. I mean, when I was a Calvinist, I would appeal to mystery. I would make not the exact same claims that, that white is making, but I would, Say, well, you know, he's transcendent and, you know, and we don't understand all of his ways. We have to trust him. But at the end of the day, I had a diametrically opposed, internally conflicting view, and I would wrap it in mystery. And it caused unmeasurable amounts of stress and strain and, and issues in my walk with God and my relationships with others. And uh, once I stopped wrapping it in mystery and said, well, what, 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 what if they're not compatible? What if one of these or both of these are in some way off just a little bit or completely wrong. And I started really going to the text and considering them. Then I saw, oh, I need to throw this out. Uh, this actually is, is what scriptures teach. Oh, I need to throw that. This is what scripture. Oh, look, the early church held to all of this. Like, oh, okay. We kind of went astray here. But uh, but you have to wrap it in in mystery or heavy cognitive dissonance. And, and I don't think you're aware you're even doing it. I think I was yeah. doing it. One of the, one of the big things about any ideology that 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 will gaslight you and i think I've, I've referred to this before i think total depravity is a form of spiritual abuse and, and gaslighting because it makes you surrender your sense making but i think ultimately it makes you the prisoner of your own jail or the or the the jailer of your own prison and so you are now tasked after you've been indoctrinated with keeping yourself in this system and it causes this sort of conflict and, and dissonance and uh, once I realized that I was my own jailer, uh, I found freedom in Christ in a, in a way I never experienced before. Well, and where, where it really gets hairy and difficult sometimes is that uh, some of the Calvinists' rebuttals to objections against Calvinism are the same kinds of answers that a non-Calvinist apologist will give mm -hmm. in response to objections about why God would allow certain things. How, why, why would God knowing this is going to happen or even, even from the most extreme open theist view, 
where God may not know what's going to happen in the future, he certainly still sees something happening in the present and he could still step in and stop something from happening and he doesn't. Um, how do you, as an apologist, explain such things? And a lot of times the, the answers that we as non-Calvinists give are similar to that of Calvinists in those, in those kinds of answers. And so that's where it becomes kind of this crossover of explanations that kind of gets tangled and, and, um, and, and you're trying to defend your view of God and, and d differentiate it from their view of God's decree and, and, and God's permission versus his actual decreative will and these kinds of things. And that's where it gets really sticky and difficult sometimes to, to unpack all those issues. But nevertheless, let, let's uh, continue with the, the video here. Something along these lines. Um, something along the lines, the, the greatest gift that one of the greatest gifts my parents gave me is that from the time I could understand, I have believed that the Bible is truly and fully the Word of God, without question. Because that's what we, that's not only what we taught, but we, you know, she sat on, I've, I've got the video of her at nine years of age sitting on the front row when I'm debating Muslims uh, on the deity of Christ in 1999. Um, we, teach our children that we show that in how we live the word of God and trust the word of God and interact with the world. My kids remember sitting in the back of our, I forget what year it was. It was a Ford. Um, was, was that an escort? I think it was, I think it was an escort. He's, he's, he's it's so long ago. It was a used car that we thankfully were given sort of by D.L. Culliver. Anyway, um, we're driving around and they've got their, they've, I bought these little whiteboards for them with the little erasable markers. Those were fairly new back then. <laughs> new tech. And we're doing Christian worldview stuff. We're doing how, how the Christian faith interfaces with what's going on in the world. And we'd be talking about what, I don't know, was it Clinton or whoever it was back then, what they were doing and what does the word of God say? This is how you show these things you demonstrate these things to none of which would have any impact whatsoever if they're not regenerate if they're not chosen by god before they were born and regenerate all those things that he's listing which i agree with absolutely are, are essential and and things that parents should do and i honestly believe that when white's doing those things whether it's consistent or inconsistent with his theology or not whether it's uh, cognitive dissonance or not I can't psychologize him on all those issues. Um, I, I, I genuinely think that he loves his daughter, genuinely wants her to follow the father, and he genuinely believes that the things he's doing um, are, are a necessary and important uh, influence upon his daughter. But what we're saying is, if what you're saying is true, all of those things are superfluous. If, if she's not picked and regenerated, all of that's for naught. And therefore, if, heaven forbid, a child of someone who believes like you do goes astray, then they are left with the quandary of having to deal with the fact that they did raise their child in the way they should go. They did all the things you said, but their child went another way because ultimately God didn't want them. God did not pick them. God did not regenerate them. And I still and called to worship and serve that God. That's that's the issue you were addressing. That's the issue we are addressing, the problem we're addressing. And you don't have to know whether they're elect or not. You don't have to demand say that you demand grace from God or any of those kinds of things that we're accused of in order for that argument to be true and difficult. And a Calvinist, I think, that's objectively honest and intellectually honest would just come right out and say, yeah, that is difficult for us. We have to really struggle with that, and 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 it's hard. It's a hard pill to swallow, uh, on on our view. I don't know how else you get around that. Yeah, ahead, and John. I think as it as it was said earlier uh, tonight, all of that effort um, of James or any other parent to, you know, to teach biblical truth to your children, you could find out as a Calvinist that that was actually being utilized the, you know, he, he's emphasizing the ends and the means, 
well, that could be being utilized by God as the means for their ultimate reprobation. That could be what God is, right. God's using you, possibly, James or, or other parents, to proclaim the gospel so that it will further harden them and bring further condemnation. Um, right. And you just can't know that. You, you have to always kind of... You, it's really 50 50 either God is, you know, I'm sitting down with my daughter right now. I'm communicating what the gospel is. It's, it's 50 50 at best. Either God right now is using this. will use this to, he or either God wants to use this for the good of my son or my daughter, or he wants to use this for their ultimate demise. Um, and you can't know one way or the other. Um, and the, yeah. like you said, the fact that you don't know, the fact that you don't know that that just confuses me that that being offered so often as a response well we don't know whether they're elect or not well that that's really be beside the point that's that has nothing yeah. really to do with what is being said the it doesn't affect the argument it, it doesn't affect the it argument it doesn't affect the argument yeah. no no yeah. because yeah. the point remains that those are the two options he, either he's doing yeah. one or the other and you're right you don't know and so as you're sitting there passionately communicating what you think is true about Christ and salvation and forgiveness, the character of God, you don't know whether that's mm -hmm. being used for the good of your child or, or for evil, uh, um, uh, destruction um, against them. And that, that's, the, that's the issue where I think, again, as you're pointing out, what would be nice from James White is if instead of just repeating these things instead of just repeating oh well god has god has both ends and and means if he would stop and hear what was just said and say okay yeah i, I get that i hear what you're saying that that's a challenge for the calvinist and and here's how here's how i think through that here's how i resolve that here's how i'm able to sit down with my daughter as a calvinist and still have you know confidence or hope or peace um, I don't know how he would do that. I don't know how a Calvinist would do that unless, again, you have that cognitive dissonance where you sort of set aside your Calvinism for that time, and then you kind of come back to it after. Um, I don't know how, but I think that's more what we're, we're off we're asking for is, is how do you resolve that? At what, yeah. what, what is the solution to that? Um, uh, because just and simply things, stating God has ends and means yeah. simply re, it just repeats the objection we're raising. It just simply yeah, repeats yeah, the problem. Yeah, it doesn't answer anything. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I don't know what came before this. Maybe it was something along the lines of, well, you know, as a Calvinist, you just you have to accept that there is no promise. Now, this is this okay. Now we get into real theology, not this kind of stuff. There is no promise that every one of your children is going to be elect. That's I think there I've got some Presbyterian friends that actually struggle with that. Um, I, th I think they actually have a different viewpoint on that, and that that, that does concern me. Um, but the fact is, there, there is no promise in Scripture that the faith is going to be genetically passed on. And one of the great heartbreaks of any Christian parent is to see their offspring going astray, rejecting the faith, joining another religion, Whatever it might be. And it's easy to go, well, where did I fail here? Where did I fail? Because none of us have ever been perfect. But then again, the reality is that if you... What, why, would, why would a Calvinist wonder whether they failed yeah. or not? Yeah. Because you could be the worst heathen parent in the world if your kids elect they're going to get regenerated and they're going to believe, or you could be the best Christian parent that's ever walked the face of the earth. If they're not elect and they're not regenerate, they won't believe. Mm -hmm. So why in the world would any consistent Calvinist think to themselves, what did I do wrong or where did I misstep or what could I have done differently when you believe that the decision is ultimately God's, not your child's. And, that, that, and that's, that, again, where the cognitive dissonance has to be yeah. in place for them to really deal with this issue. For, for a Calvinist in that system, again, consistent Calvinism, to say, where did I go wrong as a parent? 
is equally prideful should should be viewed as equally prideful and man centered as the non Calvinist who says I must believe in order to be regenerated, um, because both are putting the burden on man equally in different areas. Yes, but it's the same. The emphasis is the same. And so for James White, even I think it's. I mean, I would have to listen through that again. But it seemed like he was sort of acknowledging maybe a bit that he has struggled with that feeling like, man, I haven't done as well as I, I could have in some places, which we all should. Obviously, every parent is going to feel that. Um, but I don't, yeah, it just maybe, seems like how maybe is that saying, not Maybe equally? he's talking hypothetically, maybe he's just saying hypothetically someone might think this, uh -huh. but that would be a wrong way of thinking. Maybe, maybe that's what he's posing there. Um, but, you know, again. You can't really I, think I, that way as a Calvinist, right. or you shouldn't, you, you shouldn't, shouldn't think that way any more than you right. should think that it's your faith or your response that results in salvation or, or regeneration or the grace of God. To, to further hit on the point you're making, I was, was discussing this today or yesterday, but I was, I was talking with a Calvinist and he said, Oh, I've done nothing to contribute to my salvation except the sin necessary to, you know, to require my damnation. And I was like, why are you boasting? You know, in, in determinism, you didn't contribute anything. God decreed that. What do you why are you so yeah. man-centered? Why are you why are you boasting in your sinfulness? Like in theistic determinism, everything God decreed. Why are you taking glory from why him are you taking over... credit? Why are you taking credit for those choices to sin yeah, when everything's like, decreed by God, including those choices to sin? Yeah. Including your sin. So, you think that it was your self-determinism, your autonomy that that resulted in that sin? Like how how boastful, how arrogant of you to think that that happened apart from God's decree. Yeah. And so in, in that, in that exhaustive theistic deterministic worldview, whether it's our sin, whether it's our failings and our honest ignorance or whatever the case may, all of that, all of that is, is an outflowing from the eternal, you know, effectual decree of God, whatsoever comes to pass. I mean, it's in the confessions. So, you know, to, to say, well, you know, I struggle. Did I do this right as a father? As a, did I, did I do this wrong? Like, you know, again, you're operating on the assumption that you had options that you were free to do otherwise. And I think that betrays the uh, untenable nature of uh, living a consistent deterministic worldview. Yeah, it's it's like I've heard it argued a thousand times with apologists debating atheistic determinists, um, a naturalistic determinist, and, and saying that even and even some naturalistic determinists acknowledging the fact that everyone lives as if free will is true, even if they philosophically affirm determinism, because there's no, really no other tenable way of living uh, to be practical about it. But Dan, the freedom of grace, the freedom of grace must be free. Grace cannot be demanded. No one's demanding grace, James White. No one, no one has the power to demand grace. No one is saying that everyone deserves grace. No one is saying that um, God owes everybody salvation or grace. Whenever you use that as your defense for one of the accusations we're bringing as if we disagree with you, you're simply putting out a red herring. Um, you're, it's almost like the same, it's the same exact argument as saying, well, we don't know who the elect are, as if that has anything to do with the argument we just made. It is not answering the argument. It is, it's diverting to some other thing over here. Look over here, look over here. So that I don't have to answer the argument because I know I don't have a, co a cognitive answer to the argument, a cogent answer to the argument. So I have to say, look over here, look over here at something that doesn't even relate to the question being asked. Grace is, is an effectual power from God that accomplishes his own glorious purposes. And it is, Chapter and verse. Where, where does it ever say that grace is an effectual power of God that accomplishes his purposes? Because when I see grace talked about in the scripture, it's it's a gift. It's the, the charis. I mean, it's the same root. It's a gift. It's an appeal. Making his appeal through us. Be beseeching you, begging you. Be reconciled to God. Um, it's it's offered. It's it's uh, lavished. It's given out. It's... it's um, Come unto me, all you are weaker and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That, that's the kind, uh, holding out his hands to them all day long, patiently waiting for them to come. That, that's the kinds of language that I hear when, when talking about grace. I have yet to see the passage of Scripture 
which expresses grace in that kind of a an effectual, demanding, forceful way that James White wants to try to paint it. It's just not. It's just not a biblical concept, as far as I can tell. It's free in its exercise by God. If it's demanded, it's no longer grace. It's now a I give you this, you give me that. It's a it's a quid pro quo type system. Okay, so as soon as you can find me any theologian that teaches that we demand grace or that we have to demand grace or that everyone's owed grace, then we'll answer we'll answer them with your argument. But until then, you're 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 really good at defeating straw man arguments that you've created and knocked down. But actually address what we're saying if you want to defeat us. Go ahead, Warren. Or I was just gonna Jordan, say this, whoever's talking. It's a non it's it's an it's an impossible scenario assuming James White's worldview. So no so he's criticizing a view he doesn't believe is even possible. Um and, and he's he's giving a definition and a defense for why we can't do these things, but he, he's treating it as though it's it's an actual possibility that he's refuting, as though someone could come in and say, God, I want grace and demand it. We don't teach that that's something that you can do. And in theistic determinism, the only way that would be possible is if God decreed some guide or girl to come in and, and do that. And so it just seems to be a complete distraction from the topic at hand. It's just, it's more of this. It's more of, ah, oh, they don't believe yeah. this, my pearls. Ah, but it's like, when do you actually address you know what you're supposed to be responding to here. I, don't, I haven't seen him do that yet, and we're no, we're now not. I think three hours into this video. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it started it's... with a one minute clip from that one guy. You know, <laughs> the, that, yeah, that guy. one guy. Well, it's uh, exchange the word demand for expect. We don't. Nobody's demanding God's grace, but I think we certainly would expect. We have expectation of God's grace based on who we he expect is. Expect him to keep his promise. That, uh, yeah, as a child who has loving, caring parents has an expectation that that those parents are going to give what is good and loving and merciful. And so I just I find this whole argument bizarre as if our our baseline should be to assume that God is unloving. Our baseline should be to assume that God is no, not You should be you should even be salvation. shocked. You should be yeah. shocked that God would even love one person. That should just shock right. you. Really? There's, why there's why should that shock false, you? There's such a false piety, I think, that is involved in that. As as if what's what, happening what here should, is we're what demanding. What should shock you? Yeah. What should shock you, yeah. based upon the revelation of Jesus, is that God <laughs> wouldn't love even one person. That that right. based upon the revelation we see of Christ, who teaches things like the Good Samaritan story: stop and help your enemies, and give to the poor, and go the extra mile, and give them your cloak as well, and be good to those who hurt you, and and love your enemies. All the teachings of Scripture. It should shock you to death to find out that God, there's somebody out there that God doesn't love or want or desire. Yeah. That should when, shock when you. Mo when Moses interceded for the rebellious, unbelieving Israelites when they refused to enter the Promised Land. Was he demanding the grace of God? No, he he was he was expecting that God would be true to his name that he had just revealed to Moses. I am compassionate and forgive this. God God presented himself to Israel, and the baseline he wanted them to know is this is who I am. This is my name. I'm going to express the innermost parts of my character. And, and what it involves is I like to show kindness to people. I like to be forgiving. I Yes, I'm just. But I'm merciful to yeah. How, there, there's like more generations than I'm, yeah. you know, show justice to, and so and so I just I I find it absurd to me and and a bit offensive almost that that it would be it just feels like he wants us to get on his his playing ground of we need to assume that God is not so nice and he doesn't need to be nice he doesn't need to forgive he doesn't need to love enemies he's interested we should assume baseline should be we should assume God's all about wrath and justice and then it should you know here and there he shows mercy and we should be glad for the little mercy he shows the few and I just think it, it's just a, a strange way to present God in light of 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 again how he's been revealed uh in Jesus especially but but all throughout Old and New Testament. And, and, and I think that's his way of putting it to where you say, okay, those provisionists out there expect God to be loving because they, they believe God's loving. 
And, and you can't expect that of God because God isn't loving on Calvinism in, in, in the universal sense of the word. He, he's not God so love the world and everyone in it. It's God lo- so love the elect of the world um, and only the elect in, in, a, in a salvific way, at least. And so, um, and so that's, I think his way of making that argument is that you can't expect God to be loving towards anybody because the Bible doesn't teach that that's the kind of God we believe in. And of course that's the debate. So it's, yeah. it's again, I guess it's a form of question begging argument. You're assuming yeah, basically. your form of yeah. God basically is what it is. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that most religions have. What makes Christianity different is the grace of God is free. It cannot be demanded. And in fact, it has been rightly said, it's not, it's not, it's normally called unmerited grace. It's actually demerited grace. It is favor toward those who rightfully should receive punishment. Do people who believe in God still deserve to be punished for the sins they've committed? Does belief remove that? In other words, just because the prodigal comes home to beg for a slave job doesn't mean he's he's uh, absolved of his wrongdoing. He he doesn't deserve to be forgiven based upon his return home. Um, asking for forgiveness doesn't merit being forgiven. If it did, then there would be no reason for atonement for Christ to die. Um, and so we need atonement. We need we need Christ because we have sinned and because we've sinned we need christ and so to say that faith is somehow what earns or merits is to assume we don't need christ and and i don't know how many times we have to point this out but um but it, it seems like it has to point it out every time and and of course he doesn't listen to our replies so he keeps making the same mistakes it sounds like all right from a holy god but instead receive his grace. And so you cannot demand that of your children. Now, again, um, I don't know where the one guy is, but we know that Leighton wants to be an open theist and and Warren McGrew is an open theist. Um, So their stuff... And I, I encourage people to go listen to Warren's talk with the Trinity Radio guys. And and actually listen to his explanation of his view of dynamic omniscience. It's not it's not the classical, uh, typical way in which people have uh, uh, painted open theism over the years. At least my understanding of it, Warren. Um, and and again, I don't want this to turn into a long discussion over open theism. We have our differences of uh, of opinion on some of those views, possibly, but. It's, it's almost purely a philosophical difference, distinction between how you look at the things of God. And there's been nothing I've ever said or indicated that makes me want to change my particular perspective, e- any more so towards Molinism even. Um, my, my motivations for not going the full Molinist route is almost the same motivation for me not to go the open theist route. And, and, and I've explained that numbers of times, numerous times on this broadcast as one who's a theologian and not a philosopher and one who I don't think that when I, when I say, I don't think that the Bible tells us the answer to specific questions with regard to the infant knowledge of God and how it relates to time and space. I am fine living in the mystery of that. And I use John Lennox's quote all the time to appeal to the mystery of that. Use CS Lewis's quote in regard to those things, because I don't think I have to know that in order to be a Bible believing Christian and, and Calvinist answer that question by inserting determinism, um, both Molinist and open theist and dynamic perspectives all insert a philosophical perspective of libertarian freedom. And so, yes, I side more with those who affirm libertarian freedom for obvious reasons. Many of us share the same interpretive uh, uh, grid and interpretive uh, understanding of many of the same texts but doesn't mean that philosophically we land in the exact same place or give the exact same explanations to our differing views. And so, and again, this is just his way. He knows that open theism is a pariah in his world, in his community, and Mm -hmm. and and even in my world, my community as well, he knows that it's a pariah. Um, He knows that if if he can paint me as an open theist or, or what his people think is open theism, which is 
you know, all kinds of things that he, the way he's painted it over the years. Um, and that if he can make me into one, then he doesn't have to really deal with my arguments because after all, this guy is so far out there that his views are, are so, um, you just can't, by the way, you're muted Warren. So I can see you're trying to talk, but you're, I was gonna, can you put me on the screen real quick? Yeah. 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 White is an expert propagandist. He's not, he's not opening this to say why babies go to hell. He's not giving you any philosophical arguments or reasons for why babies go to hell. He's saying, Oh, Leighton, Leighton dreams about being an open theist. Now, Dr. White, I've challenged you to debate dynamic omniscience and you refuse. Why? Because you begin by affirming my premise, sir. You're a dirty, heretical adherent of dynamic omniscience, just like all of historic classical Christianity. You just don't understand it. So, <laughs> so he, he begins by affirming my position, but he wants to label it in a, in the most, uh, uh, he, wants smear, he wants to cover me in manure. And then he wants us to like hold hands. So you get some of the stink on you. But, but the problem is, is that we both, we, all of us, uh, open theists, Molinist, uh, Calvinists, simple foreknowledge guys, they all begin. And I've had an episode with Ryan Mullins on my show. All of us begin by affirming dynamic omniscience. I just stay there. I don't, I don't go off in all these different views. I just stay in the dynamic omniscience. Um, when they encounter the creative thing, then they all go in different ways, like different cats, but he's just trying, he's trying to use propaganda instead of, and rhetoric, instead of actually opening this up and going, this is why I believe babies go to hell and I'm still a Christian. But, you know, that's, that's what he's trying to do. He'll, 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 he'll wave it around and he'll go, oh, Leighton dreams about open theism and oh, my pearls, my indignation, no response, no substance. No response. But here's the thing. If you're if you're in that camp, right? We, you and I are both cowboy fans, right, Leighton? Well, right. well it's really know, hard. It, it's really it, hard for me right now, I'll just tell you. <laughs> it's 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 very hard to be a cowboys fan. It has been since the nineties. Is it but, once a cowboy once a cowboys fan, always a cowboys fan? Or do I do I have the option to to defect? See, we're kind just of wondering. we're kind of like we're kind of like James White's listeners, right? You're like yeah, go Cowboys. You know, like maybe he'll present a valid rebuttal this time. You no, know? because we're rooting <laughs> for our make team. It, maybe they'll make it one one game through the playoffs. <laughs> and I, I feel I feel like anyone who was watching this and was aware of what our comments actually were, and then they're looking at White's response, they're going, "Man, he's playing like the Cowboys." You know, they, there's no defense. There's there's no offense. There's just they're they're here. They've shown up. You know, they've got the uniform on. But but that's all he's offering us. There's there's nothing. It's just wave this, call you name. You're stupid. You're ignorant. You're in a dirty open. Oh, theater. you want to talk about you want to talk about a hornet's nest, Warren? You just compared James White to the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, I, know. I don't know. I, that, now that, wait till Marlon get, hears that. You may have gone way over the. <laughs> wait till Marlon Wilson hears that, man. Now now I'm 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 going to be a, a not just a, a liar, but I'm going to be a damned heretic. That's that's you know you don't you don't do that to the Cowboys. Stop. You stepped over the line there, Mister. I did. I did. <laughs> it, it feels like oh, uh, go ahead. you know. Sorry, he, Ward. Well, he he puts sure. White puts so much energy and effort into responding to Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or or Islam. Uh, he doesn't simply get on his show and say, "Oh, well, these guys they they dream about they dream about Muhammad, they dream about Joseph Smith." Oh, I don't listen to them. You know, he he takes his time. And he he walks through their arguments and responds to them, and so when it just feels like, as you're saying, he knows he has an audience who will just dismiss what is being said based on the as as you call it, Leighton, the just the boogeyman uh, assertion, like oh these guys are just these they they you know they belong in this you know bad category over here, so you know, wave my Bible a little bit and, and give the appearance of having responded to what they said and, and move on. And, and like you said, he, he, he's shown up, he's, he's put the uniform on. That's a interesting illustration. Uh, but is he really saying anything? Is he really responding to the, the, the core of, of the complaints and the critique that is being brought forward that he's, he's playing the video 
he he's describing in some sense he's 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 explaining what what the complaints are but then he's not really dealing with them uh he's just using it feels like a broad variety of of ad hominems and and fallacies to to fill up a, uh you know yeah. 10 or 15 minutes of airtime yeah chris harris jumps in here again and, and again he, one of our resident calvinists and so i want i want to confront this here nothing can happen that wasn't decreed by god but that doesn't remove freedom and contingency listen chris if he decreed for you to be born without the freedom then how can you say that the decree does not remove the freedom if you're born totally unable as the as the confessions say we are under calvinism then how can you also say it doesn't remove freedom either god decreed for us to be born without the freedom or he didn't and on calvinism we don't have freedom we don't have the liberty of the will to accept the gospel and yet you say the decree doesn't remove freedom i don't get that chris and so uh, anyway i just had to comment on that of prevenient grace which is an unbiblical concept you'll find it nowhere in scripture and it's the it's the cheap cellophane tape that holds synergism together you got to have you got to have it in there somewhere, or you might as well go ahead and get the Pelagius tattoo that you really would like to get anyways. And so, prevenient grace is this idea Pelagius, that God is theist. helping people along. Um, we're going we're gonna to hear this from Greg Boyd in a second. Um, but, but the reality is, there is no such thing as prevenient grace. In Does he even know that I don't teach the typical doctrines of prevenient grace. Um, and again, that's why I guess he's calling me the Pelagian um, instead of, so he, he's in agreement with me that there's no, there's no uh, prevenient grace in the, in the classical Arminian sense. That doesn't mean that there's not, there's not the need for God's help because obviously he came to seek to save the lost. He sent Christ. That's help. He sent the gospel. That's help. Uh, he sends the Holy spirit to bring conviction to the world. That's help. Uh, you want to call all those prevenient graces that that's great, but that's not typically what's meant by the term prevenient grace. It's usually in the Augustinian grid, that thing, which makes a dead man at least alive enough to be able to respond to the, the Bible again, positively. And we don't believe in that because we don't believe that the fall God decreed that the fall would cause people to lose their ability to respond to his appeal to be reconciled from the fall. And so we think that's a bunch of Augustinian baggage that's added to the text. So I, I'm not sure he even, I don't, I, I'm assuming he knows that, but I, maybe Greg Boyd uh, is more of takes more of the classical Arminian approach on that particular point, and maybe that's what he's talking about. I don't know. Again, it's bloviating. Uh, that's all it is. Yeah. I mean, he, he could he could fill a hot air balloon and and go around the world in eighty days with this response, but there's nothing substantive as far as rebuttal other than indignation. It's just. But hey, it, it's it's cool to call me a liar and say you're not impressed. I mean, okay. I guess that scores points in your when you're when you're trying to get people on your team to root for you. I mean, you know, Cowboys have the cheerleaders, you know. So, I mean, you know, White has his bloviation, but um, there's nothing here that's substantive. Uh, I remember buying a book on Prevenient Grace about ten years ago, and I was just, you know, okay, I want to see what the arguments are. There were no arguments. It was it was pure philosophy. There was no exegesis um, because it's just it's just simply not there. And so, as an open theist, are you saying that God is trying with everybody, but it's not up to him anyways? See, it's real easy to do. And remember, um, in a number of the debates, people have, you know, George Bryson at the end of the debate in, what was that, 2001? I'm pretty sure it didn't Boyd. Boyd doesn't hold to what you hold to. Warren does, I mean, y'all don't hold the same views with regard to omniscience or God's knowledge from my understanding. Is no, that right? Or do you I, even not, know what Boyd holds to? I'm not exactly sure what Boyd holds to. I mean, he's, he does hold to an open position. Uh, he's written in defense of something called neo-Molinism. You know, there's some overlap there. Um, I don't know enough about Boyd to say where we agree or disagree you know, I think he affirms divine cognition and the freedom of God. Um, I think every I think every position begins 
with an affirmation of dynamic omniscience, but then where they go from there is like I said, it herds cats. So I would say there's certainly going to be a kernel of, of Dio in, in Boyd and White. Uh, that's why that you have like appeals to logical moments and things like this, because historically, even all temporal views of God have to preserve his freedom. And uh, so they're going to say there was a logical moment where he was free to create or not to create. So, you know, you see White affirming dynamic omniscience. You see, uh, you know, our friend Tim Stratton, William Lane Craig, simple foreknowledge guys, open theists. Everybody begins, you know, my view. I'm the I'm the orthodox cat in the room. And then they hit um, they hit creation and they go, well, did that fundamentally change all things and establish them and why? And that's where everybody kind of de deviates. So I don't really know how close Boyd is to my view. I do know that for a while I considered um, neo-Molinism when I was studying the topic, but I just, I have a problem with Molinism. I just, I, I think it's, it's the height of hypocrisy to call, um, call Arminians pure philosophy. Oh, they're using pure philosophy. And then, and, and not to acknowledge that determinism, theistic determinism is, is also pure Pure philosophy. It is. Uh, I mean, it's kind of funny. Um, it, takes, Joshua, it takes a very knowledgeable and articulate French philosopher to to really come in and, and do it justice in defense of it. You know, I mean, it's it is purely philo philosophical. Very much so. He says, um, "I I'm encountering cult politics, and I see Calvinism as heretical, as denying a gift from God, free will. It separates us from simple creatures." Again, we, I mean, we, we just, I don't typically use the term heretical. I don't th throw it around the H word when it comes to these things, because people often interpret that as to say, uh, I don't believe they're my brothers. If they believe differently than I do with regard to open theism or determinism or uh, Calvinism, uh, Arminianism, I have disagreements with all those different groups on one level or another, but it doesn't mean I have to call them heretics in order to, to, um, engage with those differing views. Now there may be some that are heretics among those different groups. Um, but it, it's not, it's not my MO to shout people down or determine whether they're a heretic or not, um, or assume that they have nefarious motivations because of their, uh, their stances on their particular views. Now that doesn't mean that I can't call out bad argumentation for bad argumentation. And what white's doing here is bad argumentation. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a good representation of, of Calvinism for, for those that are wondering whether I think it is or not, it's not. That, uh, you know, what about your children? Uh, what about your parents? Uh, is it, is it, and, it, and it's like, I'm like, oh, so you would rather trust the sinful hearts, the rebellious hearts of your children or your parents than God? Because all you're doing is saying, oh, it's up to them. God's done everything he can. There's nothing more God can do. Okay, let's talk about that because this is an argument I used when I was a Calvinist. I remember someone confronting me, a parent confronting me as a Calvinist and 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 asking this question about what about kids? And and I used this argument. I said to her, remember where I was sitting? I remember my mindset when I said it and I thought I was being really good Calvinist and I thought I was being biblical. I think my motivations were pure. I was really trying to help this person. And I asked them the question, would you rather their salvation be in the hands of God or in their hands? Because what have I done? I've put, I've, I've put this pious question to them where the only answer they can rightly give and still be pious is God. You have to, you have to say God when it comes to those two different things. But what the fallacy that I wasn't recognizing was which version of God are we talking about? Are we talking about a God that reprobates most of humanity before they're ever born? Are we talking about the version of God who desires the salvation of every man, woman, boy, and girl? Because if it's the second one, then yes, I would say God, absolutely. I want it to be in God's hands because I want um, a God who loves and desires what I desire for my child. I, I want them to love God and glorify him forever, the chief end of every man. Um, as even the Calvinistic confessions say, I want I want the best for my child because I actually love them and I believe my God loves them and wants that the best for them. And so, yeah, the God is the right answer if you believe that God has the best interest of your child in mind. If you believe that God very likely or could possibly not have the best interest for my of my child in mind, then it's very difficult to say God given those that that pre preconception of God being a reprobator of humanity. Yep. And so that that's where this becomes a difficult question. You want to add to that, Warren? 
Or, no, or, I was just going to say it's, it's all in the framing of the question. It, it's trying to impose a false dichotomy where you have to accept the Calvinist theistic portrayal of, of God who determines the most heinous of evil or man who you know is, is flawed and you're going, Oh, what do I do? What do I? But it's a, it's a false dichotomy. It's, it's a, it's framing the, 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 the issue in a, in a, in a faulty way. And as you rightly noted, the God of the scriptures is not the God of exalt. And I, Oh, hold on. Everybody calm down, get your pitchforks, put them down. I don't mean to say we're worshiping God. I'm saying different gods. I'm saying the portrayal, the way that God operates. Okay. I'm not saying you're following a false God necessarily, but the, the, the portrayal of God in the Calvinistic system, meticulously determining every evil with specificity, uh, the type of evil, the duration, the repetitions, all of the nuances of that evil versus the God in scripture. Um, and then, you know, once you realize that, that that it's positing in that in that um, that false framing, then all of a sudden you go, oh well, yeah, of course I want the God of the Bible. I mean, this is the God who died on a cross for the world. He, he so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes, yeah, I trust God with my look. He died for my child. Why wouldn't I trust him with my child? Or, yeah, uh, every evil that's ever going to happen in my child's life originated in the mind and sovereign decree of God. I gotta. And he, 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 there's a strong chance he's eternally reprobated him. I got to, you're asking me to, it's a, it's a completely different portrayal of God, but if they can get you, if they can get you with the framing, then, you know, you fall into that trap of trying to be pious. And now you're, you're getting gaslit into accepting this faulty view of God. And, and now you're going, well, I'm going to surrender my sense making, and I'm going to move on with this. And you become the, the jailer of your own prison. Hmm. Yep. Well, gentlemen, it's three hours and 15 minutes in. That's a pretty long one, even for us. Even and all of this because of a one minute clip, Jordan. <laughs> I know. Hey, guys, I brought my bucket this time, so I'm good to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you disappear awful. earlier then? Where, where were you going? Yeah, well, I had to go use it. I don't want to do it oh, publicly, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, man you're putting the stream and live stream jordan (laughs) do what i said you're putting the stream and live stream (laughs) that's right that's exactly what what would be really embarrassing is yeah you forget to mute your mic and we start hearing noises (laughs) that that would be a bad that would be a bad that would be fun i got comments (laughs) on my channel people i don't know who who it is but others saying they're responding live live to us right now so we might have more more material here. Who's responding live future. to us right now? I, I don't know who it is. Somebody named Mike Green said, we're responding live to you. So I asked him for a link. Not sure who it is. Okay. So what we should do is play their video responding live to our video. There you go. It'll be a, like and, a circle. Eventually it'll just be like a big, a big loop <laughs> where, where we're saying one thing and then they're, they're saying another <laughs> we'll be like Matthew McConaughey and in Interstellar, and we'll just be like surrounded. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, we'll, and, you, and then you can do it. And, and you add determin <laughs> and you add determinism into there, then you you start to think, okay, now God's determining that guy to say this, and now he's going to okay. determine this guy to say that, and then there's again. <laughs> Talk about the yeah the mind melt. <laughs> yeah, very, very much. Yeah, very much my mind melt. All right, brothers and sisters. Well, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for the super chats. Appreciate everyone who is uh, tuned in to ask good questions. Um, let's not always assume the worst about people who disagree with us. Let's all, not also assume if we see a clip on the internet that everything behind that clip is meant the way we think it might be meant, but uh, search it out. Try to figure out where the person's coming from. Listen to the the other things that people say about those, those uh, topics in order to understand their perspective. Um, and, uh, and when you leave this place, go now share Christ and show love. God bless.